Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Emerson Green. I'm here with Andrew Haranich, and uh, he's the author of Once Loved, Always Loved. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. We were just talking about this a little bit uh, beforehand, but you went to Liberty University and you're currently a grad student at Princeton Theological Seminary. So um, how did you take that pathway? And I mean, is that a common pathway for people to take? So uh, to my knowledge, it's far from common. Only two of the people I'm aware of have ever gone from Liberty University to Princeton Theological Seminary. So yes, I had all sorts of people from Liberty and from my church saying, oh, Andrew, you're going to the dark side of the force, <laughs> right? I'll be praying for you. Um, and then I would have other people who I, I never tell anybody um, that when I'm here, I never tell anybody here that I went to Liberty University unless they ask me. I just don't, it's just a rule of thumb. So I remember one day on campus, I had a red Liberty shirt. It's one of my favorite shirts. And so I just wore it. I didn't even remember it that had the word Liberty on it. But it was getting all sorts of stares. And so I never put two and two together until somebody came up to me uh, and he said, I had no idea you went to Liberty. And I didn't think uh, if I should interpret that as a compliment <laughs> or not. So, yes, it's rather uncommon. I decided to go here for primarily Ph.D. reasons because I want to go to a good Ph.D. program either at St. Andrews over in the U.K. or at Notre Dame. And uh, I don't think I'm really going to get there by just going to Liberty University. Um, so I decided to just broaden my horizon and just to engage with other ideas and um, in different academic environments than I was used to in my undergraduate year. So, yeah. Yeah. I, we have to mention that you went both to Liberty and Princeton because one of those will dramatically increase your credibility and one of those will dramatically decrease your credibility. But depending on who's listening, we don't know which is which. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Like... Okay. <laughs> I, I often tell people, I feel so I'm too progressive for the conservatives and too conservative for the progressives. If I was in the Civil War, I'd have a blue shirt and gray pants. That's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with, I mean, from what I've heard you say, I think that we come from like maybe similar backgrounds. I mean, like I have a brother who went to Liberty for a time um, and another brother who wants to go there. Um, so, I, I mean, I assume that um, we came from similar contexts. If um, I mean, it's like it's it's mostly like evangelicals and Baptists and, you know, non-denominational Protestants, right, who like end up going to Liberty. No, yeah. I mean, you have the occasional Catholic who instantly try to convert to Protestantism, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's pretty Baptist. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, like I said, the, the Liberty thing will actually increase your credibility with the, you know, like few Christians who listen to this, because then, you know, they'll be reassured that you're actually a real Christian. You don't just believe some watered down liberal nonsense that they teach you at Princeton. No, no, yeah, that was a big thing uh, when I wrote this book was um, I wrote this book while I was at Liberty. And so I had a, I came to the dark side in regards to universalism while at Liberty University. So I always have to say that in an interview because I'll get those, you know, fundamentalist Christians who will say, oh, it's not surprising that someone at Princeton came to universalism. <laughs> but I remember it was, it was one of the endorsers. It was um, it was Greg Boyd, who I reached out to while I was writing the book um, at Liberty. And he said that he was surprised that people at Liberty were even thinking like this. So, so yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah, it's like, oh, this guy from Princeton affirms universalism. Yeah, oh, I bet he does. <laughs> Water but, is wet, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the book is called Once Loved, Always Loved. And I'm just going to mention this out of the gate, almost as a PSA, that people who are universalists typically believe in hell. I mean, pretty much pretty much all of them do. I mean, there are some exceptions, but like I just wanted to mention that just in case people don't get any farther, because um, like this is a podcast, but it's also a YouTube video. And what I've noticed is people who listen on podcasts, they listen to the whole thing. You know, it could be three hours long and they'll listen to the whole thing. But on YouTube, you have people with very short attention spans. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't know why, but I just feel like that's one piece of information I just want to stick somewhere. It's like you you know universalism is not like there is no hell there is no punishment there's like you know you just die and wake up and have you know hitler wakes up in heaven next to anne frank and like that's what universalists believe no yeah um uh, i actually was talking to an individual today who found out that i wrote that book and she asked me uh, do you even believe in hell so I, I get it a lot like do you even believe in hell so i always ask them what do you mean by hell right because my answer is going to depend on how you answer that question so um, I take it that hell can be interpreted three ways as a, a place, a power, or a punishment. So there's certain people like Eleanor Stump and usually in the Catholic tradition or 
Um, Paradise Lost, John Milton, he gives this idea, even you'll find C.S. Lewis, that hell is not so much a place as a power. That hell's, They talk about hell as being actually um, in this world trying to render heaven and earth asunder, right? So what they mean by hell usually is what other Christians mean by evil or sin. So it's quite strange when those people, they call it hell. Like Satan says, I am hell in John Milton's Paradise Lost. So if someone says to me, that's what I mean by hell, I like Joshua Butler Ryan. Uh, that's what I mean by hell. I mean that hell is a power that tries to separate us from God. I say, well, okay, then, yeah, I believe in hell, right? I believe such a power exists. If they say, well, no, I don't believe that hell is a power. I think hell is a place, right? Hell is a place of punishment, post-mortem punishment. I say, well, golly, I believe in that too, right? And they say, this is the last one that I don't believe in. They'll say, well, I think that hell is a punishment, meaning hell simply is infinite punishment. And that seems to be how the Catholic catechism takes it. When you read it, it just seems that hell is infinite punishment. So if that's what you think that hell is, that's the only case in which they'll say, no, I definitely don't believe in hell. And they'll follow up by saying, but good news, the word nowhere appears in the Bible. So so if you consider yourself a biblical Christian, there's no problem there, right? So that's how I'd approach it. Yeah. No, I mean, for some people, that just sort of is Christianity, that like maximalist version of hell. Like some people exist in this place of punishment forever and there is no escape and it's completely torturous and you get there for believing the wrong things. And like, that's just the end of the story for, you know, quite a lot of people, <laughs> maybe the majority of people. And like for a lot of people that just is Christianity. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, well, you know, as an atheist, that makes my job, I guess. And so far as I have a job as an atheist, like that makes it really easy <laughs> to make my case <laughs> because like I can borrow stuff from your book. I can borrow stuff from David Bentley Hart. I can, you know, I can make these arguments against, you know, theism, even though it's not really against theism, but like I can make arguments against your conception of theism and Christianity, you know, and this has been offered by other Christians, you know, because like the traditional view is like, uh, I don't know. I just think it's like obviously wrong. It's, it's weird because, you know, like when I retrace my steps, and this is part of why I relate to David Bentley Hart so much, because he says that this would have happened to him if he didn't know that universalism was like a part of the tradition. It's like you kind of make that conflation of like Christianity with specific doctrines that are believed by many Christians. And you end up saying, well, that, that's obviously not true. That can't be true. Um, it's like internally incoherent. It's like morally and rationally incoherent. And then you end up just kind of walking away from it. I, I mean, Randall Rouser put it this way one time, like that's a theology that's like uniquely vulnerable to refutation if you want to set up this picture of the world where you have to believe the right things if you don't believe the right things before the end of this life you will go to this place of eternal torturous punishment forever and there is no escape also god is perfectly loving and just and merciful that's incoherent <laughs> um so do you do you agree with that basic sort of moral case um you know there's sort of a moral case like look the kind of hell that a lot of christians believe in it's not just it's not merciful it's not what a loving father would do are you persuaded by those kinds of moral arguments and did that factor into your conversion to universalism uh no yes i'm absolutely persuaded by those arguments right so um, a lot of this depends on your starting points so the, if you start from perfect being theism there was a book by uh, it was Catherine rogers i think it was so interesting she, she wrote a whole book on perfect being theology and then she came to the last page in like one paragraph she said she talked about hell and she said, well, if hell is inconsistent with perfect being theism, you got to get rid of hell. If it's not, we keep it. Now, I don't know which it is, so I'm just going to leave it there. And people like David Bentley Hart are like, oh, I'll tell you which one it is. Right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for our moral intuitions. I think a lot of times what happens is there are people who um, it's a certain view of Scripture. Right. So they'll come to a certain view of Scripture where they think this is God's literal word. Right. Like word for word. This is God's literal word. It, the text clearly says this. So even though I don't like it, I'm just going to go with it. That seems to be what a lot of Calvinists I may think, like J.I. Packer, is it's a terrible thing, but the text says what the text says. But then you have this cognitive dissonance where if you examine perfect being theism for enough, you say, well, this seems to go against the idea of perfect being theism. Just like, do I go with the text? Do I go with the concept of perfect being theism? So yeah, it, it's definitely a problem for some people. Now, I remember when I was a part-time apologist, I hate to admit it, but I was, uh, when I was a part-time apologist, the question I would get a lot from parents was that about hell. And uh, I remember one mother, she reached out, she said, you know, uh, I think it was her son who asked her one night, she said, how could a God of love ever send somebody there? Now, I've been prepared with C.S. Lewis's answer. Oh, don't you know, 
God doesn't send anybody there. They send themselves. Oh, how convincing. Yeah, the doors are locked from the inside <laughs> and they just never leave. The doors are, yeah, ab- absolutely, yeah. Oh, what a great God. <laughs> and I remember for the first time, it just like hit me like a ton of bricks thinking through it. I thought, you know, this is just so unconvincing to tell a mother. <laughs> and so I couldn't bring myself to tell her it. Um, and then sure enough, a couple uh, weeks later, I was tasked with answering a universalist to a, a universalist reach and said, here's a bunch of arguments against the traditional view. Now, actually, his arguments were quite terrible, uh, but I agree with his basic moral intuition. I think that's what you see with a lot of universalists is there's just a basic moral intuition that God is not worse than Hitler. Like as you put it before, <laughs> he's just not worse than Hitler. And this makes him worse than Hitler. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, people who are suffering in that, that um, like Christian sketch of things where it's like people are, you know, undergoing torture essentially that never ends. There's no escape. Like, mm-hmm. it, you know, as someone in hell in the fullness of time is going to suffer far greater than, you know, all the suffering that happened in the Holocaust. And like, um, you know, like it just seems like pretty obvious that God is not worse than Hitler. It seems like you should kind of like Maury and shift away from any understanding of God that makes him, uh, you know, just constantly committing atrocities and like just some kind of semantic wordplay about like, mm-hmm. you know, it's just not going to solve the problem. And it seems like that's as far as most evangelicals are like willing to go. Like a lot of Christians who want to defend the traditional view, they just want to like, you know, make some changes around the edges to our language as if that's somehow going to actually solve the problem of this. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, basically there's like nothing even to compare it to if you believe in this like maximalist version of hell. And like, maybe we should move, you know, across the landscape to some of the more defensible (laughs) versions of eternal conscious torment or maybe like annihilationism or something, because this like, you know, this maximalist view is just, it's so easy to beat up on. Mm-hmm. It's just so obviously wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's there's a couple of things that you said there that are really important. So the first thing I want to address is the traditionalist view, quote unquote. Now, and it's always interesting because those who usually say, "Well, oh, I'm a traditionalist. I hold the traditionalist view," hold nothing like the traditionalist view in history. All right. So what they usually hold is to a C.S. Lewis type of hell, which you won't find in Augustine. You're not going to find it in Tertullian. You're going to find it in the early church fathers. You won't find it in Father Furness. You won't find it in Thomas Aquinas. You won't find it in Basil. You won't find it like anywhere in the early church. So you start to scratch your head and wonder, how can they claim that this is the traditional view? What does it have in common with traditionalist view? Well, the only thing that it seems to have in common, really, is that people will be punished um, forever. That's the only thing it really has in common. But uh, there are quite different... Uh, there are big differences between C.S. Lewis's view and the view that you see in the early church. For example, um, do we interpret the images of fire and darkness literally, or are they metaphors? Now, I think it's really interesting if you look at people like J.P. Moreland and Lee Strobel and William Lane Craig, they say these are obviously metaphors. Really? But w- what makes you think that they're obvious metaphors? Like when we look at other Jewish texts, and it seems that they're taking language of fire literally, why should we take this metaphorically? And I think it's obvious is because of their moral intuitions. But I'd like to point something out. So I remember reading a book by R.C. Sproul in which he was talking about hell. And Sproul said that um, you not partaking in the beatific vision at any moment is a far greater punishment than enduring physical flames. So this is really interesting. So, okay, me not partaking in the beatific vision is a greater punishment at every moment than me enduring flames. Yet it, you know, people like Craig say it is inconsistent with the good nature of God to inflict literal flames. So wait, so wait a minute. It's inconsistent with the goodness of God for him to inflict a lesser punishment than a greater one. This is just bizarre. So I don't really hear any good argument for thinking that language of fire and darkness should be interpreted metaphorically. These are people that they're just really trying to avoid what are obvious moral intuitions, right? Um, So what they'll usually say is, well, you know, fire and darkness, they can't coexist. Seriously, have you been camping before? (laughs) I, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be too sarcastic, but come on, fire and darkness exist in my fireplace, let alone a campground. Um, So I guess what they mean is just like in an absolute sense, but that's not even true. Like we know of flames that don't emit a light as Chris Day has pointed out and other people before. So this is just, it's just really bad. If they're operating from moral intuitions and this is affecting their exegesis. So that's one thing I'd say is how can you call yourself a traditionalist view if you really don't hold much in common with the traditionalist view? Right. So um, that's one thing is I challenge their view being the traditional view. Then there's also the language of torture. 
right? So you'll hear people, oh, it's it's torment. It's it's not torture. <laughs> yes, it's torture. It's torture. <laughs> and so because they'll try to say, well, it's not torture because it's God's not inflicting it upon them. They're inflicting it upon themselves. But yet God intends this as a punishment, right? He intends their self-infliction upon themselves as a punishment. So mm-hmm. if you are prone to think like many sane people, that solitary confinement is often used as a punishment, then why don't you think that, you know, and some people think that it's also a form of torture too, then why don't you think that this as well meets the criteria for being torture? So yeah. no, I think it is torture. I don't think you can just get away with saying torment. So those are two things I want to say. One, I, tr- I challenge the idea that the C.S. Lewis view is the traditionalist view. And two, I would challenge the idea that this is just simply a metaphorical interpretation that is valid based on good exegesis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I was alluding to with some of the word games where it's like, well, you know, God's not doing it to you. Like God's not torturing you. Um, It's just like, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem. Or they'll say like, oh, it's not like this cartoonish thing with like, you know, Satan with like a pitchfork or something. And it's like, that was not the problem that I was (laughs) getting at. (laughs) Like, uh, but you know, I mean, I asked earlier, like, you know, do you find these kind of moral arguments convincing? And it, it sounds almost like a joke because it's like, what else would it be? But I mean, that kind of brings me to a point where I want to put a little pressure on on the universalist, because um, like I said, for a lot of people, that view of hell just is Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, why is that? Well, it's because of the biblical and scriptural constraints that appear to exist. You know, so like when I say, oh, are you, you know, are you convinced by these philosophical arguments for universalism? It's like, well, yeah, why? How else would you end up a universalist? It's not like it's laid out very clearly in the text. Um, I think it's consistent with the text, arguably, but it's it's hard for me to believe that like someone who's kind of brand new, not that this is like the ultimate test of whether it's really in there or not, but like if someone who's kind of brand new and they're just they don't know about, you know, what most Christians believe or anything, they're just reading the New Testament. I don't really think they would come away a universalist. Like, I, th- I think the odds of that are low and they might I, I feel like it, it's more likely they'd get the impression that like yeah, some people are going to depart into eternal fire, like forever. I mean, that seems to be depicted a few different places. And, you know, in Matthew, Jesus is said to have affirmed eternal conscious torment. So, you know, why do people think that Jesus affirmed eternal conscious torment? And uh, what is your response to those people? Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so you mentioned about how it would seem more probable that somebody, when they go and they read the Bible, for example, that they would come away with a non-universalist view. I'd say that, well, that depends on uh, whose translation they're reading. Um, you're obviously not going to come away with that if you read David Bentley Hart's translation. Now, you're going to come away with that if you read the Elect Standard Version, also known as the ESV, the English Standard Version. Probably, right? You're going to come away with a non-universalist view. So a lot of this depends on whose translation you're reading. And uh, all translation is an interpretation. Just for those who don't know, Uh, people's theological prejudices, they affect the entire thing, all right, especially key phrases, uh, like in Acts 14, I think it's uh, 1438 when it's talking about predestination, or in Romans 9, everywhere, it's um, colored with theological prejudices. Now, what do we do with the hard passages, right, passages that seem to teach non-universalism? So this depends on what uh, Christian tradition you come from. If you come from mainline Protestantism, um, there's many, like, this is what the institution I'm going to, where it comes from as Presbyterian, they couldn't care less, many folks, right? Just, oh, wow, um, what an amazing thing. Um, this author in, uh, Jude or Second Peter wasn't a non, was a non-universalist. How amazing. They're not going to really care, right? So it's, it's a view of, uh, the authority of scripture that is probably different from what many in apologetic circles are used to, right? Because for one thing, a lot of mainline Protestants don't actually believe in apologetics, um, but think it's that conversionism is offensive that you don't need to provide an apologetics right and so um this interpretation isn't as really known to a lot of people so they'll just sit there and say i don't care about those passages okay so um that's not going to make happy a lot of fundamentalist christians obviously so what do we do with these passages well i think that actually the universalist passages are far more in quantity and far clearer than are the non-universalist passages So there has been a long practice in the Christian tradition that we ought to interpret the clear passage, the unclear passages in light of the clear, right? So, um, for example, people who are not premillennialist will say, we need to interpret this strange passage in Revelation 20 
in light of the clearest statements that we have in something like 1 Corinthians 15, right? And so I would say that's a practice that I hold, is to interpret the unclear in light of the clear, and I think that the universalist passages are often clearer. Um, so what would be non-universalist passages? The obvious one is the sheep and the goats in uh, Matthew 25, right? 41 through 46. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, there are several things we could do with that, right? So one thing is we should ask ourselves the question, did Jesus ever give this parable? Um, now, there are a, it shouldn't be shocking, but there are a lot of uh, what people would, fundamentalists would instantly write off as liberal scholars who they don't think that Jesus ever gave this parable, right? So you won't find this parable in Mark. You won't find this parable in Q. You won't find this parable in John. You won't find this parable in anywhere else but Matthew. Uh, so that's the, not to say that it therefore Jesus could not have said it, but it just means it doesn't have multiple attestation, right? And so um, somebody like Dale Allison, for example, thinks it's highly suspect that Jesus actually said these words. So then we get into the debate of, is our authority supposed to be given to the historical Christ or the biblical Christ, right? Do we have a canonical view of scripture or is it more so we want to know what the historical Jesus says and that's what we take as authoritative. So if you can make a good case that Jesus never actually said these things, as some people think there's good reason to think, um, and you think that it's the historical Jesus that counts, you can just throw this away. This passage means nothing to you. Um, however, that's not how many people think, right? They say, no, I'm holding to a canonical view, right? <laughs> I was going to say, so so what do you say to my parents? Because <laughs> they're not going to go for any of that. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, so what would you say to somebody who says, no, I hold, I hold to a canonical view. I care about what Jesus says in the Gospels, right? Okay. Um, so what I would say to you is a couple of things. First, we see the contrast between the sheep and the goats as that of what the ESV says is eternal punishment, and eternal life. Now, surprise, surprise, I don't think that's a good translation, Right. I'm more so with N.T. Wright than I am with other universalists, too. Some universalists, what they'll want to say is, what, well, the word Ionios, which is being used to describe the punishment, which is used to describe uh, the life, just means age enduring. It just means a long, long time, right? So I don't think that's actually true in this case. I think that what's going on here is the author is referring to that which is in the age to come. So the punishment which is in the age to come, the life which is in the age to come or pertaining to the age to come. And so you'd have people like Marcus Borg, N.T. Wright, and uh, David Bentley Hart, people across the board who agree, yep, that's a good way of viewing the usage of this word. Um, okay, so what does that tell us? Well, I'm going to have breakfast tomorrow, okay? I might, but I'm going to have breakfast tomorrow, and tomorrow I'm going to go to work. Now, both activities occur tomorrow, but simply because I told you when, does not tell you how long each activity will be. Just because the punishment and the life um, are both in the age to come, that just tells you when they shall be. That doesn't tell you how long each shall be, right? So that's an easy way of rectifying. They're both going to partake um, in the age to come, but this is, passage doesn't settle the issue of how long it shall be. Now, someone like Augustine, who just honestly gives me a headache, it says, this, oh, but, you know, but the same word is used to describe the punishment, to use to describe the life. Like I said, it doesn't matter if it's just describing when, but if it's just describing how long, well, adjectives are supposed to modify their noun, right? So if I say, oh, you know, that is such a, a tall book. And I say, wow, that's such a tall tower, okay? You know, tall is relevant to the noun that it describes, okay? So it can still have a different uh, quality or quantitative description based on the noun it describes. So Augustine's parallelism still does nothing. Um, so what I would do, again, is say, we need to interpret the unclear and let the clear is say, in other passages outside of Matthew 25, do we have any hint, for example, that the life of the age to come will be forever? And people say, absolutely, 1 Corinthians 15. People are going to be raised. Death will be no more. They'll be raised and perishable. There it is right then and there. You can't get clearer. It's like, all right. And what about the punishment? I say, well, you got these passages here. Though. It's like everybody's going to be saved. <laughs> so no. So yeah, I think Matthew 25 is a failure, especially if you think the word for punishment, Colossus, should be understood as chasing or pruning. So it's a term that can mean it can mean uh, a remedial punishment, as you'll see in, in the works of Plato and other contemporary works. Even I think in the book of Acts, there's one case where the rulers want to uh, chastise the apostles who are preaching right in the name of Jesus. They say, don't do that. So they want to um, they want to apply this sort of remedial punishment to get them to stop doing that. Right. The problem is this word can also describe capital punishment. Right. So it can also mean execution. And so then we could look contextually and say, okay, which makes better sense? 
uh, right? Does a remedial punishment make better sense or capital punishment? Well, uh, the individuals, the ghosts are being described. The word language that's used for them is immature ghosts. That's literally how they're being talked about is immature goats. And then even the description that the story tells is that of immature. Like, oh my gosh, when did we see you doing this? So we had no idea. And the answer is capital punishment for you, <laughs> right? Um, so those are a bunch of responses we give. One, if we look at the language of punishment, is it remedial? And we see that there are two different ways of looking at this, okay? Which one makes better sense of the language that's being used to describe the goats? I think remedial language. Um, but I think also that the punishment and the life of describing when it shall happen, not necessarily how, how long. So that's a whole bunch of ways that I just um, address that one passage. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, that does make sense. Um, it's hard not to come to the text, though, with your like preconceived <laughs> notions. And like, you know, I can, I'm trying to like put my old evangelical hat back on and like there are all kinds of like red flags that you're raising and you're every was just more every time you speak you say that you know you're always interpreting the text i don't interpret anything i just look at the words on the page um you know so i mean those kinds of like naive views about it's not even about the bible it's just about like reading texts like i feel like that's almost a separate conversation where i like mm -hmm. have to convince them that there's some amount of interpreting that goes on like whenever you're reading a text you can still respect the author and authorial intent and all that and still recognize that like you know you are going to have to do some interpreting and you know the other thing is that the text is you know famously pretty underdetermined like especially like scriptural you know scripture and you know the biblical texts like you can interpret them in many many different ways mm -hmm. and it's like for me that's why I th i've thought if i was a christian um, then I would I would have to rely on like moral intuition more than, you know, this kind of vague text that I'm reading in a different language than it was written. It's like I, you know, if I'm a Christian, you know, I think that God designed my moral and cognitive faculties. And like, I mean, why would I think as a Christian? Oh, yeah. You know, those moral intuitions that God gave you, you can't trust those. He put those in your head and they are utterly deceptive. <laughs> like you can't trust. So. Like, I mean, something that seems pretty clear, like you said, interpreting like the unclear in the light of the clear. Well, something that's pretty clear within the Christian tradition is that we're supposed to understand God as some kind of father. Like we're supposed to un we're supposed to understand our relationship to God through the analogy of fatherhood. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you take that seriously, you know, like assuming that that's not intended to be deceptive or misleading, <laughs> but intended to help us better understand the relationship that we're supposed to have with God. If you start taking that seriously, then eternal conscious torment is just out. It's just off the table. Like no, no father would like, you know, would allow their children to be consigned to eternal conscious torment. Like what rule wouldn't you break to prevent your child from having that kind of eternal fate? You know, but um, I, I just think like I'm kind of of two minds here because on the one hand, I want to defend universalism because I'm this kind of like conditional universalist i guess where i'm like you know if you know given these assumptions like let's just say god exists you know perfect being theism is true well then something like universalism is probably true let's say something like christianity is true well then universalism pretty much has to be true um you know like i th like that is the opinion i hold and it's not the same opinion that every atheist has so it feels like yeah i should i should defend universalism because um uh, I mean, it seems true to me, you know, conditional on these these other these other propositions. But then on the other hand, I kind of think like if Christianity can't like support universalism, if Christianity is committed to eternal conscious torment, then so what? Like then that just means Christianity is not true. Um, so, I mean, I feel like a lot of Christians who aren't on your side are kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Like they really are like, no, you cannot be a universalist and a Christian. I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not really my problem, but I mean, you know, they're kind of, you know, if I ever am going to return to Christianity, they're just delaying my return <laughs> every time they make a good point where I'm like, oh yeah, you can't be a Christian and a universalist. But I mean, obviously I, I, I think you can be a Christian and a universalist, but I just, I don't understand why people are are so committed to um, to arguing that 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 you just can't be a Christian universalist? Yeah, I think it was um, it was Charles Darwin who said that he doesn't understand why anybody would wish that Christianity would be true because then it would mean that his family members and his friends are headed to a place of eternal punishment. 
And Bertrand Russell also said that um, Jesus had one moral flaw, and that was that he believed in, and taught in hell, <laughs> right? And so instead of correcting Bertrand Russell, say, well, you know, Bertrand, uh, well, you know, Charles, there's another way of looking at these passages and, and interpreting um, the Christian tradition as a whole on this issue. And that's holding out hope to those people. It's like, you're darn right, and you're going to hell forever. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> I, I've often asked that traditionalist, I said, when you're evangelizing to people, because this happened with uh, Ignatius of Loyola when he went to the Japanese culture, and these were people who they had very deep uh, reverence towards their ancestors. They were told, yep, they are roasting in hell. And, and they said, uh, they gathered together and they went back to Ignatius and they said, is there any hope for them? Like, is there anything we can do to help them? And um, they had tears in their eyes that Ignatius consulted with other people and went back and said, sorry, no, I mean, there's nothing that can be done. And uh, some of them rejected Christianity on that basis. Now, I think this is amazing. I mean, why can't we, when we're evangelizing, admit that, you know, there's another way, right, of looking at this. It kind of reminds me of uh, John Piper, who is, of course, a famous Calvinist. But he said that uh, one time he interacted with a lady who she just couldn't bring herself to believe in Calvinism, right? And she said that if she became convinced that Calvin was true, she'd have to leave the Christian faith. So what John Piper says, all right, then don't believe in Calvinism, right? It, it's more important that you uh, maintain your faith in God and your relationship with Christ than that you believe in Calvinism. And so she became an open theist, and he had no qualms about that. Now, I, I would think that, well, can't the logic also apply to this with universalism, right? And I don't even know what the fear is. I think I think what the fear is, is um, it's sort of like a Pascalian wager is, oh, but Andrew, what if you're wrong and you're leading people to hell? And so that's the assumption is that I, I guess is they're thinking that I'm going to um, – give people the mentality that you can just put it off a little bit longer. But then I could also make the same argument about deathbed conversions. I said, well, but if you believe that people can just convert in their deathbed, I, I've i met people who said, you know, Andrew, um, I believe, you know, the Christian life is true and yada, yada, but I want to live this certain way and I still have time, right? So, so, so then you're going to have to tell these people, actually, no deathbed conversions, right? You're not guaranteed that. And so um, I don't know if you know, but there are Christians who exactly argue that. They say, yep, deathbed conversion is not allowed. It, it can't happen. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, I think like you said, they wind up shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have some maybe less charitable things to say about why they so desperately cling to <laughs> eternal conscious torment. <laughs> um, I think it's like really upsetting to a certain kind of person. The idea that, you know, these atheists or whoever is making them feel dumb on the internet, the, the fact that they won't wake up and be like, Oh no, I was wrong. And then be tortured forever. They're like, Man, I'm just, I'm so, <laughs> they're so excited about my eternal conscious torment. They can't bear to part with the thought of it. And like, um, I mean, didn't Aquinas say something about this? Like part of the pleasure of heaven is peeking over the cliff edge and hearing the screams of <laughs> people who are being tormented. Like, <laughs> like that increases the pleasure of heaven. It's like, I think um, Christopher Hitchens actually said this where he was like, uh, someone put it to him like, you know, I can see why, you know, wish fulfillment would lead to heaven, but why would it lead to hell? And he's like, well, it's easy. It's for other people to go to. <laughs> and like, you know, if you take away this kind of eternal conscious torment, then I think some people lose the place where all these others are going to. And, you know, I, I think that like maybe it's not totally just like psychotic, like I'm kind of making it sound like it is actually motivated by you know, a uh, yearning for justice or something. And they don't realize that in the process, they've invented like the most unjust punishment that you could possibly conceive of. It's like infinitely disproportionate. Um, but still, it's motivated by like, oh, I, I don't want to think that like Hitler just got away with it or something. And they feel like that's what universalists are saying on some level, like Hitler's just going to get away with it. Um, so, I mean, do you... <laughs> You want to talk about the big guy uh, himself <laughs> as well? I mean, sure. like, so Hitler, yeah. is he is he going to get away with it? I mean, we already mentioned he's not just going to wake up in heaven one day. So, I mean, what are you comfortable, Andrew, with Hitler being in heaven alongside Jews or like a rapist in heaven alongside his rape victim? Or, you know, people give lots of examples of this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there's an old saying in universalism uh, list circles that there's only so many words that you can say before Hitler's name comes up, right? <laughs> That's just the case. Um, but, but this is, yeah, so this is an important issue because there are some people who say that universalists lack empathy, right? Um, 
And I think that certainly some do, right? The way that certain things are worded, it almost comes across to victims like, get over it. They're going to wind up there, move on. And yeah, it, it can be really harmful towards certain victims, right? So yeah, what should we do with people like Hitler? Well, I think that John Hick was really helpful here in which uh, in the Brothers Karamazov, of course, there's a famous scene with Ivan. Uh, and I think it's his brother and they're arguing together about the problem of evil. And uh, John Hick actually comments in that passage. He says, you know, what Ivan is missing is that these evil people that he's picturing, when they'll be in this state of eternal union, it's not like these people will still have a wicked character, right? And they're all just kumbaya together. I mean, these people have been transformed in their character, right? So somebody like Hitler, what would that mean for him? Well, it would mean that somebody like Hitler would develop such a character that he would be unable to perform those acts, right, that he committed in his earthly life, that he would look upon those acts with scorn and see them for the wrong that they were, that he would love his Jewish neighbor with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, that he would love Jesus, and you know, he would love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, um, and as himself, that he would do this, right, that he would seek union and forgiveness from the Jew and from God, and then the traditionalists rise up and say, no, get, get thee back to hell. Um, this is really weird because this is somebody who a traditionalist would say, well, as long as he did all that prior to death, he would be good. But one second after, it's no good. And it's like, well, why? why? What, make, what makes it that? So I think it's because a lot of times when people frame the question of Hitler, they don't think of a reformed Hitler. There was an interview with Melissa Dougherty and Clay Jones, which was very uncharitable towards universalism. And they said, oh my gosh, in universalism, you'll have a rape victim having to be in heaven with somebody who's not even slightly uh, remorseful for what they did. And that's just a caricature. I don't know if any universalist believes that. Many universalists uh, believe that they'll have to be go through the fires of hell, so to speak, that they'll have to be purged of that sin, that all those impurities will melt away, right? So this is just ridiculous to claim that these are people who aren't even slightly wrong for what they did in heaven. So I think that's many times what's missing is people just think, okay, Hitler's in his bunker. Okay, he's in his bunker. Shoots in the pit, and he's in heaven in his mansion. Okay, I, I, there is no universalist in the relevant literature who argues that way, right? So yeah, it's just a character at the end of the day. And I mean, it's funny because when you start pushing back and be like, can, can you explain why Hitler doesn't deserve to be in heaven? Like even after he's undergone like all this moral, this painful moral transformation, you know, over the course of who knows how long. And it's just like, can you, can you explain why like he, he wouldn't. And it's like, they start undermining like the basic Christian message where they're just like, well, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve salvation. What did he do to deserve it? And it's like, I thought none of us deserved it. <laughs> like I thought like that was sort of the point of grace was that, you know, like we, we actually don't deserve it. And then now we're looking at a, at a guy who you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah grace, whatever, but he really doesn't deserve it. It's like the prodigal son returned from mm -hmm. uh, the far country that, you know, he reforms his character. He's sorry for all that he's done. He looks for deeper communion with his father. His father says, that's great, son. Now there's a great spot for you in the servants quarters over there. We're going <laughs> to, <No, laughs> it's like, no, I mean, the heart of the father is, you know, welcome home, dear prodigal. Right. And so it's a, it's a very strange uh, view with the, the traditionalist that, well, he, you know, he may be, even if he is reformed, uh, his deeds just can't be forgiven, right? They're beyond forgiveness. It's like, and yours aren't. Like C.S. Lewis talks about this. So, so in other words, your sins deserve forgiveness, but theirs don't. It comes yeah. Down to it. <laughs> yeah. Again, it seems like it's kind of a basic part of the Christian message that like we've all sinned. Like none of us really deserve what um, you know. No, none of us really deserve salvation. Um, it's a gift freely given. Like it's just, it's just like Sunday school stuff that like suddenly just goes out the window just to defend because this precious, precious belief that people will roast for all time needs to be defended. <laughs> there, there's an old parable that, um, so there's a bunch of people standing before the pearly gates and they, and they got their golden tickets, right? Oh, Willy Wonka. Uh, they got their golden tickets. They're standing there. And then a rumor starts to spread that God has decided to forgive the others too. And the people are furious they stamp their feet. They gnash their teeth. And sure enough, this is the last judgment. And they're condemned to hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. I, yeah, I I um I was recently thinking about the book of Jonah, and um I couldn't remember the book, but I could perfectly remember the Veggie Tales episode about Jonah. And uh I just like I thought about it and then I went back and read the story. It's a really short 
you know, chapter. It's a really short book. And um, by the way, the VeggieTales thing completely preserved <laughs> everything that was there in the story. And I actually remembered it because of that. But anyway, it just seems like like that is like a I don't want to call it like a universalist book, but it really lends some support to universalism and the way that people react to universalism. Like Jonah is so upset that God is like going to save all these people who like they did all these horrible things, but then they repented and asked for forgiveness and then God spares them. And Jonah's like really, truly upset by this. And he's just like, I would rather be dead than this happen. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. that is, that is actually how people react to, you know, they're like, if universalism is true, I would be deeply, deeply upset. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you that I think the book of Jonah offers biblical precedent in support of our basic moral intuitions in this regard. Um, and and J.A. Packer also once famously said that if you want to see people damned, there's something wrong with you, <laughs> right? And I, I think he's absolutely right. But the problem is I know people who want to see others damned. So, so why is that? Well, I hate to say, but I think sometimes what it is is that that Christians want to live the lives that other people are living, but they think that they'll go to hell if they live those lives, right? They'll think that they'll face some sort of punishment or whatnot. And so then they console themselves with saying, well, you know what? They're going to go to hell for this. And so I've met them. And so they think, if I can't have it, at least I can have the joy of knowing that they're going to get their comeuppance when it um, when all is said and done. And that's just really disturbing. But those people do, in fact, exist. So I think, yeah, that's that's one reason why uh, certain people are content with there being a place of eternal punishment. Yeah, they're they're not hopeful universalists. They're hopeful <laughs> infernalists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, we, we mentioned um, punishment quite a few times, and it seems like, you know, the role of punishment, if you are like, you know, a loving father, it, it seems like the ultimate goal of punishment, um, you know, you, you could be like, you could believe in like restorative justice, you could even just be a straight, you know, retributionist. But it, it doesn't, I mean, at least at face value, it doesn't really seem like any particular theory of punishment is like, totally incompatible with universalism. I mean, you could get more and more specific and then it might become incompatible, but it seems like, you know, any understanding of punishment that has been developed by like ethicists, you know, Christian or not, it just, I don't understand how you're going to end up with a never ending punishment being like proportionate or just, or um, really accomplishing like anything that you would want to accomplish. Cause like, if the goal is to, restore people into you know re right relationship with god and with other people you know it's like reconciliation is the ultimate goal well then obviously you should be a universalist but even if you think like well look this person did something wrong and they just deserve to suffer and there's no other explanation there's no other reason like they just did a bad thing and now they deserve to suffer it seems like you could still be a universalist <laughs> um, like uh yeah it just seems like whatever role you think punishment is supposed to play um, I don't understand how if you're concerned with justice and you're concerned with, um, you know, the, the things that you should be concerned, like Eric Wrighton makes this point about like, OK, what's like the Christian understanding of punishment? And once he, uh, you know, finished writing all that stuff, I, I forget what the project was exactly. But once he finished writing about, you know, what is the purpose of punishment in the Christian worldview? He's like, well, I'm, I'm kind of forced to be a universalist. No, yeah, I remember um, <clears throat> interviewing him a couple of years ago, and he he, he told me that um, he presented that paper that you're talking about, and then somebody asked him right after, said, "Okay, so so um, how do you think this affects your view of the Christian doctrine of hell?" And he's like, "Oh, I didn't even really think about that." <laughs> but um, yeah, so his book is um, called God's Final Victory, and I encourage people if you haven't bought that, buy that after you buy my book. But you know, buy my book first. Now, <clears throat> you're right. So it it's just really hard for people to try to justify. Uh, the justice of an infinite punishment. So this is the interesting thing, is that a criticism that non-universalists often offer against universalists is, oh, universalists are all about God being a God of love. A God, like, here's the trump card. God is also a God of justice. Yeah, another reason why I am a universalist, because I believe God is just. I believe the alternative is enormously unjust. So it, that is no trump card. So I see it all the time. It's like, universalists forget that um, God is a just God, and then he can't let wicked people get away. How do you get from God must punish wicked people to God must punish wicked people eternally, right? It's a strange thing. So what they'll usually do is, um, it goes back to Jonathan Edwards, 
and people repeat this like it's some amazing buddhist mantra or something like oh don't you know <laughs> any any sin against an infinite god demerits an infinite punishment okay uh, i i go into death in the book why this is just utter nonsense okay i would use a different word but i hope this is a family friendly channel <laughs> uh, utter nonsense mm -hmm. um so one thing is that this is argument is taking into account the status of the one offended against not the one who is offended um so that's just not how a court system works right especially nowadays so if i was to have um if i was to hit the president of the united states okay i was to go up and slap him versus let's i mean say, his head might cave in like a pumpkin if you hit this particular <laughs> president <laughs> okay yeah that's, that's a good point um don't think of the current president <laughs> or the poor one all right just think of the president abstract okay, right, okay. If i was to go up and hit the president first the six-year-old kid was to go up and hit the president would they treat the six-year-old kid as they would treat me he would say well golly no so, wait but we both hit the president Mm -hmm. You know, so so we should get the same price, but no, because there are other factors we need to take into account, such as culpability, intention, um, all sorts of things, harm that was done. So when you look at all these things, it gets really odd. So you say, all right, harm that was done, harm that was done, harm that was done. Um, if God is classically conceived, what harm did we do? Oh, nothing. Oh, wow. Um, okay, <laughs> intention. Um, you know, what was my intention or culpability? So if you believe, like many Christians do in the doctrine of original sin, then we're born sick, right? So are, would we be as culpable as somebody like Adam um, on the Augustinian view? Well, even Augustinians will say, well, no, we're not as culpable as Adam because Adam had certain uh, pre-natural graces that we don't even have in our current state, right? So we're less guilty than Adam, okay? I'm sorry, we're less culpable than Adam, but we would, we would get the same sin. It, it's weird because in the Bible, different sins are described, different punishments, so um, people often like to quote, like you hear all the time from traditionalists, like, oh, don't you worry. Um, that Buddhist monk who oh, was so kind to the poor, he'll get less beatings than Hitler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God is a God of justice. It's <laughs> like, okay. Um, so that's interesting. What they're getting that from is the Gospel of Luke, where the Son of Man returns from the far kingdom. He comes back, and there's um, servants who they have are different culpability. You know, it's, and it says that. One servant gets more lashes than another. It does not say, and one of them got an endless drubbing. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say that. Um, so yeah, so the, the infinite argument, what it would seem to mean is that if any sin against an infinite God demands an infinite punishment, it would seem that all sins are therefore equal, uh, but they're just not. If you read the Bible, it speaks about uh, there is sin that leads to death, but not all sin leads to death. Or there is the what some people have interpreted as the, the unpardonable sin. I mean, there's so many that demand different punishments in the Old Testament that are merited out. So it just seems clear that no, not all sin is equal, right? Uh, so they say, well, you know, there's different degrees of infinity. And this is like, oh my gosh, right? So no, that argument is utter nonsense. And then what they'll try to say, like someone like Mike Winger, they'll say, oh, I had a new revelation. Isn't this amazing? New revelation. Yeah. People in hell keep sinning. So they keep getting punished for it. Oh, now I can go to bed at night and think, mm, I solved the problem of hell. It's just ridiculous. Um, so I, I could go on, but I, I'm curious what you think about all that so far. Yeah, I mean, I love that response of, of like, well, I mean, you committed sins against an infinite God. And it's like, well, I mean, it it feels like I lied to my mom. I don't, I'm not sure where God enters into it, but I, I accept that like, I mean, it feels like that's something between me and this other moral agent. I don't directly see how God's involved, but even just assuming that he is, why would God's property of, you know, okay, so he's infinite in some respect, um, infinite in power, I guess, in knowledge and goodness. It's like, okay, so he's infinite in a few of his attributes or properties. And it's like, for some reason, when I commit a sin against him, aka lie to my mom, something about his nature, you know, it, it like grabs onto my sin and then now my sin has the property that he had it's like okay well it's not like my sin is now trinitarian in nature because i sinned against a trinitarian god but for some reason my sin is infinite now because i committed it against an infinite god i literally cannot follow the train of logic there like how that is even like metaphysically supposed to work or like logically supposed to work it makes zero sense to me at all so william lane craig is like well actually rejecting god is a kind of medicine um, and it's like super duper bad. <laughs> so like, you know, Hitler's not in hell because of the Holocaust. He's in hell because he rejected God, if he rejected God. 
Um, he might not have, in which case that horrible scene we were outlining earlier, that would actually be the case on the model of like, you know, the, the way that some Christians view Christianity, that stuff happens all the time. The rapist and the rape victim going to heaven and they just wake up there and there's like, there's no, you know, purgatorial process of like growth or development or anything. They just like the thing that they are accusing universalists of believing, which they don't. They actually do believe they're like, yeah, these like these horrible people are just unreformed, going to end up in heaven. Um, yeah, th so th there's that thing, but um, I kind of lost my train of thought about uh Hitler and, and the Jews because I'm like, well, I mean, neither of them are going to heaven, <laughs> according to, to most Christians. So you, you suffer in the Holocaust and then you die and then you go to hell. It turns out the Holocaust was just a warm up for uh, the true horrors that awaited you. So, so um, this is something that I usually do with people where, so they'll just throw the word infinity, 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 right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a small word. So that's why I don't think people really take it seriously. So so what I usually do is I said, okay, I won't put the thing into perspective. All right, okay, 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 okay I, I get it. All right, so you have this individual. He dies in a state of um, separation from God, okay? So he goes to hell. So, so he's in hell. So 15 million years later, he, he's there. And 6 billion years later, he's there. And 23 quintillion years later, he's there. And 156 trillion years there, by golly, he's still there. And 52 quintillion years later, he's still And, and when I usually do, and I keep on going on for like 30 <laughs> seconds, people start realizing, oh my gosh, what is the point anymore? <laughs> what on earth is the point? So it's, it's, they don't get that when you just say infinity. They mm -hmm. don't. Okay. So I found that really, really helpful. Every time I do that, the person, <laughs> when I do it to is like, oh man, that sounds awful another thing i'd like to point out like you were pointing out uh, <clears throat> when someone says sin against an infinite god it's like well, what part of being infinite makes it that you need to um, need to be punished infinitely right so there's some part of god is it he's infinitely old I mean, it's just really wrong to sin against old people, especially really old people, right? So it's like, okay, so it's it's worse because my grandfather is older than my mom for me to sin against my grandfather because he's simply older, right? Um, okay, that doesn't seem to be biblical. Like, oh, well, no, it's because um, God is so good. He, he's more good than anything else. It's like, okay, so if I was to steal from a baker, and it turns out this baker is a sleazeball, right? He's... um. Like a Christian, what would Christian say to sleep? Oh, yeah, he's a he's a potty mouth. He watches porn. He sleeps around, stuff like that. And it's like versus um, I was to steal from a different baker. Oh, he's you know who's just a, an amazing, nice, charitable person, right? Gives away money to uh, poor folks and all goes to church and all that. And I go to a court of law and say, Your Honor, I deserve a less punishment <laughs> than if I stole from uh, this Mother Teresa over here because this guy's just a sleaze. Would any judge really take that seriously? The judge is like, are you kidding me? Right? So we're not punished more severely in a court of law because the person that we sinned against was of a better character than another person had we sinned against them. Right? So that seems really odd too. Um, then people will say, well, you know, it's because if I was, to, like I said earlier, if you were Andrew were to sin uh, against, um, let's say, a judge, uh, for example, that's worse than if you were to sin against your little brother. Now, that sounds really profound until you think about it for about 15 seconds, and that's not too profound. You have to say, well, why is it that you are punished uh, more harshly for lying to a judge than lying to your brother? And that's because of the harm that is um, that you're able to do when you lie to a judge versus when you lie to a brother. Right? When, when I lie in a court of law to a judge, uh, depending on the trial, there are high stakes. When I lied to my brother about like, little things, what on earth is at stake? So, yeah, it sounds profound for about 10 seconds. And then you think about it like, oh, golly, you know, that's just not going to work. So, yeah, so that's how I think about a lot of these arguments. They sound profound in the face. You sin against an infinite God, demerits infinite punishment. But there's really nothing profound about it. It's like saying that God is one hand clapping. Sounds profound, but it's really not. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the way it presents God, like if he is... You know, if our sin of rejecting him or whatever our sin is that warrants um, eternal hell, like it kind of paints God in a different light than you were saying earlier, like the more classical conception where it's like, OK, what was the harm done to God when we rejected him? Well, nothing. Um, I mean, not to him. So it's like um, we but on, on William Lane Craig's conception, God is like especially thin skinned and like he kind of overreacts, I would say, um, to our rejection of him. If uh, he damns us for eternity, you know, like you said, 
53 quintillion years later, 12 trillion years after that, you know, another 900 billion years after that. And you're still just, you know, according to Mike Winger, sinning <laughs> and just perpetually, <laughs> you know, you never learn. Um, but yeah, it's like you, you never really repent. And, um, you know, that's another thing that I, I didn't realize was fairly common, I guess, um, when I was younger, that sort of post-mortem changes are like pretty acceptable to most like theologians and philosophers and like a lot of people who I know now. Um, you know, the idea of like being saved post-mortem or there's some there's some kind of important development in the story that happens after your earthly death. That was just like totally foreign to me. And now it seems like almost everyone I know who I talk to about this kind of thing, almost everyone I know accepts that stuff can happen after your earthly death. And it's not like, hope you get the right answer. You've got this brief little window. So like, think about that long timeline again. You know, it's like, there's this tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver way, way, way on the end. And it's like, what you do, and according to a lot of Christians, like what you believe, like what doxastic states you're in during that tiny little sliver determines what happens to you like for the entire like 99.9 .9 repeating you know uh you know section of the timeline that is going to be your existence and it just seems like you know if you think about it just for you know a little bit like just upon reflection yeah it's like there why wouldn't there be any room for development or evolution or changes of any kind after your earthly death that's like such an arbitrary cutoff you know like why would that be the cutoff like if someone um you know, takes their own life or something. Hmm. It's like, why would that be? Okay, well, you know, there is this, uh, you know, teenager who takes his own life and it's like, well, that's the end of his story. You know, like he's just going to be suffering for all eternity now. They're going to, it's just static, no changes, no development, no nothing. It's just the same thing forever now because of the choices that someone made when they were like, a teenager you know they've they've been a fully like cognitively aware they've passed the age of reason like only a few years ago and they made a decision that's just screwed them over forever like it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense yeah um so, so there's a bunch there so one thing i'd say is um i'm reminded of a conversation i had with my brother-in-law in which i made the point to him that even if it was that we deserved an infinite punishment i mean didn't jesus pay for it according to your view like he he covered he, he covered the bill and so, um, <clears throat> so if we re are reformed, if we repent, the bills has already been covered, right? The infinite punishment has already been paid for. So it's not like God needs to enact it again. He's already got it. And if you repent, then God can just say, well, you know what? Um, <clears throat> Christ died for your sins. He suffered in your place. So come on in and join the, the gang, right? So even if a sin against an infinite God demerits an infinite punishment, so what? Jesus, Jesus took care of it. So what? Let's move on. Um, so that's why I say the, um, even if it was true, non-universalism would still not follow, right? You still have to prove that it doesn't. Now you said uh, post-mortem repentance. Uh, so this is a really interesting conversation because some people who are desperate to not let universalism take place will say, well, yes, I'll allow for post-mortem repentance. But even if you allow for post-mortem repentance, it still doesn't guarantee universalism. Um, well, that's to be seen, right? That's to be debated, right? Can somebody really go on and on for trillions of years and uh, be enduring uh, suffering and great affliction uh, upon themselves and not seek out repentance? That seems very hard to conceive. Um, but so, yeah, so what do we do with the idea of post-mortem repentance? You brought up cases of suicide, which I remember a couple years ago, I knew four people who committed suicide in the span of about a month. And so this was a really personal thing. I've had uh, one family member who committed suicide, another family member who attempted. So it's very personal. Now, in the Christian tradition, it was long thought that there's a special circle in hell for you. Haven't you read Dante? Um, now, people have softened on this position because lo and behold, there's such a thing as psychology. <laughs> right? We, we study, we realize, oh my gosh, you know, there are mental diseases and afflictions that people face, right? Sometimes that are beyond their control. And so I think that people started softening on the idea of just people being damned with no um, choice or no option for postmortem repentance, right? In the case of people who have committed suicide, and they softened on that. Uh, but then I think they softened on a whole lot of other people. So I'm reminded of a story where I can't remember the name of a book, but it's a guy who he's going to be hung. And in the story, right, he's about to be hung with a rope snapped. He gets away and has a grand old adventure. But at the end of the story, you realize the rope never actually snapped. But right? he was hung, but this was all going on in his head. 
So even if you don't believe in post-mortem repentance, you could believe in something like that, that at the moment of death is kind of like Harry Potter meeting Dumbledore in the Deathly Hallows, right? That um, you meet God at Hogwarts Station, and it could be um, as as long as it takes within that one moment for that person to be saved. So technically, it's not post-mortem repentance, and you could still have it. So even if someone says, I'm not open to a post-mortem repentance, I could still say, well, what about this case? Well, what about near-death experiences? What about this? But <clears throat> it's really interesting if you actually look at the scriptural witness when it comes to post-mortem repentance. So one of the first things that I do is I point out resuscitations in which certain people, right, they've been dead for a while and they're brought back to life, right? Um, so you have stories like this in the book of Kings where there's an individual who's tossed onto the bones of Elisha and he's brought back or both Elijah and Elijah. They raise um, people. You have Jesus, of course, uh, raises the widow of Nain's son. Uh, no, no, or that's Elisha. He raises a widow's son. Um, you have Lazarus, of course, who is brought back. You have all, all these people resuscitated, right? And so I, I like to ask people, okay, um, do you think that they were all in a salvific state before they died? Right. Uh, what, what are the, what's the likelihood that at least one of them wasn't? So some people could say, well, you know, there's just no way of knowing, right? And I say, like, okay. <clears throat> but in church history, we do have accounts of things like this taking place where the people are said not, explicitly said not to be believers when they died, but became believers after. So, oh no, is God cheating? Is he giving these people second chances, not others? Oh my gosh, he's playing favorites. So that's usually what I'll start off with is the resuscitations. And so accounts where it seems like somebody was not a believer prior to death and darn it, God broke the rules and gave them a second chance. What ought we to do with that? But there's one individual who it could seem uh, we do have an example of scripture, was resuscitated when he died in the state of at least apostasy. So this would be Jonah. Now, personally, I'm not sure what to do with this story. I, I lean towards Calvin and Lewis in thinking that this is a um, a fictitious narrative about an, a real prophet, <clears throat> but that the narrative didn't actually take place, right? But I, I can't say that in fundamentalist church, I'll be thrown out. So if you're going to interpret this story literally, then you have this problem that it seems like when Jonah is in the belly of the great fish that he dies, right? You have language that seems like he goes down to Sheol, euphemism for that he dies. And it says that when the great fish spits him out, that um, Jonah's told, arise and go to Nineveh. Well, the same word that's used arise there is also used by Jesus when he tells the little girl, tell you the kum, I say to you, arise, right? That's a little girl. And so um, and then there's also a parallel between Jesus and Jonah, right? They're compared, right? Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, for this long, Christ will be in the earth for this long. Now, the parallel makes a lot better sense if Jonah was, in fact, dead. And so there have been many Christians who believe that um, Jonah did die in the belly of the great fish. Well, this is really interesting uh, because if he did, in fact, die in the belly of the great fish, it seems pretty clear he died in the state of apostasy, right? But then God brought him back. And so then this would be a case where I'd look at this and say, you know, is God cheating, right, and giving this, this really interesting individual a second chance, right? So you start with resuscitations. Um, then I would go to actual text that it looks like um, teaches post more repentance. Or you could simply say this, hey, man, there are these passages that I have here that say that all will be saved in the end, all, all meaning all. And um, obviously, if people die in a state of apostasy or die in a state of sin, but eventually all persons will be saved, something needs to happen in between. So either it's post more repentance or all persons are saved at uh, the great white throne judgment, right? The, uh, I don't like that language. That sounds too dispensationalist. Um, the day of judgment, they'll be saved there. As you could kind of get from Russell Wolf, he doesn't believe this, but you could kind of get from his work and make a case for it. Um, so the passages that they'll offer against post more repentance to are really weird. I, I wonder if you agree. They're like, oh, don't you know that story of um, Dives, the rich man, and Lazarus? That uh, seems to seal the deal for me. <laughs> really, that seems like a joke. Um, or they'll say Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 it is appointed for man wants to die and then comes judgment. Mm, brother, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, did you bother to read the full verse or bother to even read it in context? Um, so even if I would just take this out of text portion of the verse, which says appointed to man wants to die and then comes judgment, it still doesn't tell me anything. It just tells me, okay, so somebody dies and there's a judgment. Isn't that exactly what the universalist believes? It doesn't say, and someone dies and then he's punished uh, for all eternity, right? It doesn't say that. Um, so yeah, none of these passages, I think that people often offer against post mortem repentance are actually convincing the slightest. And I think that you do have biblical precedent for post mortem repentance. Yeah. It's almost like these texts, you can interpret them in different ways in totally good faith. It's very strange. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
if there is, uh, you know, this infinite stretch of time, you know, that's good, we're, we're all going to, you know, continue existing according to, you know, everyone other than annihilationists, like we're going to continue existing. It's like, well, why, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we get more chances? Like Josh Rasmussen has this, um, argument from, you know, infinite chances. Like if we're given infinite chances to repent and to grow, you know, closer to, and to you know, have like a reconciled relationship with this being of infinite love, like this being of perfect love and goodness. It's like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that being of perfect love and goodness. Like, well, I mean, I think, I mean, I agree with, you know, David Bentley Hart that like as a rational being, it's pretty much unavoidable that you're going to gravitate towards this being of perfect goodness um, in the fullness of time. And I also agree with Josh that like given infinite chances, that is going to be, you know, the like the overarching direction that you're going to be headed. Um, yeah, but I guess um, some people do think we're going to be annihilated, though. You know, so uh, I mean, we, we've kind of just been beating up on like this really strong version of hell. Um, but like, what about, you know, something that's kind of between eternal conscious torment and universalism? Just the idea that like the people who aren't saved, which we haven't really been talking about the criteria for salvation, which maybe it's best we don't. But like, you know, we're just talking about what happens after we die, you know, according to the Christian tradition. And it's like, well, some people say that, you know, the people who don't have salvation will be annihilated. You know, they'll die for real. Like what what most atheists think is going to happen anyway. Like that's actually going to happen to, uh, you know, well, it depends who you ask if it's going to happen to atheists and agnostics and Muslims and Mormons and everybody else or like, you know, who's it going to happen to? That's a separate question. But, you know, that's the fate of the damned. You know, they're, they're just going to be annihilated because God loves us so much that he kills us eventually. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... um. I, I never get this. It's always with a con really fundamentalist conservative Christian that they're like, guys, I'm, I'm coming out and just saying, you know, the, the Lord has worked on me and I'm now an annihilationist as if it's some great thing. <laughs> like, uh, so like Mike Winger kind of hinted at this in his um, last video that he did on hell, which was like last week or something, which, oh, there's really good biblical precedent for annihilationism as if we should be hopeful annihilationists. So uh, this was in Lee Strobel's book on uh, his a case for heaven or something. They're always bad books. But a, a case for heaven, and uh, he was talking with uh, Paul Copan. It was almost like they're making the case that we should really hope that annihilationism is true. <laughs> and for the life of me, I don't get it. Um, so these are the same people who think that self-assisted suicide is wrong, that medically assisted suicide is wrong. Um, so I don't get how this works because if you hold to a free-willed uh, C.S. Lewis view – then it would seem that this would be the route, not capital punishment, right? That's more retributive. So if you want to hold the C.S. Lewis view, and then at the same time say that um, here on earth, that actually, you know, metaphysically assisted suicide and medically assisted suicide is wrong for these reasons, then you should also examine if the reasons you give for why you think medically assisted suicide is wrong and bring them to bear against um, your hope for annihilationism, right? Because if it's going to be a free will choice for annihilationism, that sounds like some sort of a self-assisted suicide or medically assisted suicide to me. And so it seems a little bit inconsistent there, right? Really inconsistent. Now, um, and so, yeah, the idea is, I guess they're saying, well, we're saving them more pain. I'm like, but when you argue against people who are in support of self-assisted and medically assisted suicide, I, I hear like people like Sean McDowell um, and other folks, you argue all the time that we should seek palliative um, care that seeks to reduce pain, right? Eliminate the pain without eliminating the um, experiencer. Why can't I just say the same thing about annihilationism? Is that God should come up with ways of eliminating the pain without eliminating the one experiencing the pain? It just seems kind of obvious. Um, and then also, is it really merciful to withhold the beatific vision from somebody? <laughs> like, oh, what a great act in the God's great act of mercy. He has withheld the beatific vision for them and kept them from supremely worthwhile happiness. I am so glad I'm an annihilationist. So bizarre. Um, so most annihilationists I meet aren't of the free will sort although that seems to be the only sort of annihilation that actually seems to make moral sense um usually they're retributivists the ones that i meet I'm not saying that they're the dominant group but they tend to be the loudest group and so they believe in some sort of metaphysical capital punishment right <laughs> um so if you're not a big believer in capital punishment as most sane moral people in our society um would say is just deplorable capital punishment then why should you be in support of like divine capital punishment 
right? If you acknowledge, hey, you know what? There are better ways of treating criminals than simply um, killing them. Then, then why shouldn't this lead your moral intuition to say, you know, God should have better ways of dealing with criminals than simply annihilating them, right? So um, I think really what it comes down to is you have most annihilation is they're making a lot of scriptural arguments to say, well, look at this passage and look at this passage and look at this parable and look at that. So I think they're well aware that their moral arguments don't make any sense whatsoever, but they just say, well, you know what? This dusty old text written several thousand years ago said this, so we're going to go with that. And okay, so I have a couple of things to say on that. First of all, it should be obvious I have a different view of scripture and the role that it plays uh, than a fundamentalist Christian. So when I look at um, Numbers 31, for example, or the book of um, Joshua, God forbid, the book of Judges, I don't say, my goodness, you know, isn't that amazing what's going on? God commanded it. I guess they got to do it. I say, you know what? This is deplorable what's going on, right? This this goes against the grain of my deepest moral intuitions. And so, yes, I'm interpreting those passages in light of my moral intuitions. And um, I remember bringing this up to a, to an annihilation. It's like the question of moral intuitions, and he didn't even want to talk about it. So yeah, in my experience, many annihilationists are simply making scriptural arguments. The ones that do make the philosophical arguments usually make it in favor of the free will annihilationism. But when they do that, I remember like I asked Richard Swinburne and uh, Jonathan Van Vick, I asked them, so you're in support of what seems to be a free will annihilationism. Are you also in support of uh, medically assisted suicide, right? Or self-assisted suicide. And uh, they said, uh, one said no comment and one said he wasn't sure. So. Okay. Yeah, no, that's an interesting parallel. But, you know, in, in bringing it back to fatherhood, it's like, well, imagine you're like, yeah, my my kid really offended me the other day, so I killed him. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't know if there's anything your child could do where you would be like, yeah, I guess it's time to murder you <laughs> because I love you so much. I mean, and if there were, if you did find yourself in those circumstances, it would be due to like your limitations or something like that. Like if there was some horrible circumstance, like where they're in excruciating pain and there's just no way to stop it or something like that. But God's obviously not in that position. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, uh, I mean, speaking of Josh Rasmussen, again, he, he used this analogy once, um, where he said like, you know, imagine that you're a loving father and your children are in a playground and there's this pit in the middle of the playground that is infinitely deep. And it's like, you know, would, because you respect free will so much, would you allow them to play near the edge of the, uh, pit? Or would you kind of keep them away from it? Would you like board it up almost? <laughs> or like, a, you know, even if they did fall in, you would reach in and, and grab them back out of it. You wouldn't just let them fall because you respect their free will. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that any understanding of, you know, our heavenly father, God is supposed to be our heavenly father. If you have an understanding of God where your earthly father is like a better father than God, that's probably not a good understanding of God. It seems like you can kind of shift away from that understanding or that conception of God if it makes it so your earthly father is actually a better father, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I have a great relationship with my dad. I love my dad. I think he's a great father. I would love to be as good of a father as he was to me, but I don't think he's supposed to be a better father than God. <laughs> um, so, if your understanding of God, you know, makes that the case, then it seems like you probably have, you know, a flawed conception of God. Yeah. So um, that was, I think you're right on the money. There's, there's a few things that I would say. One is, um, so you couldn't call God father here at Princeton. Um, you would lose points on a paper like I did. Um, God oh. is mother. Don't we know? Oh, okay. um, so, 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 <laughs> So I, I partly say that in jest, but I partly say this to, to make this point. I wondered, I, after reading Marcus Borg, I don't know if you've ever heard of Marcus Borg. He was a famous uh, Jesus seminar individual, uh, wrote really well, was basically a guru. And so Marcus Borg had a book called The God You Never Knew, something like that, in which um, in one portion, it was really actually thought-provoking section. He said, if you were to conceive of God as mother as opposed to father, would that change the way that you prayed? Right. And there have been studies that have been done that say, oh, absolutely, this is what the studies show, is that people do pray to God differently when they conceive of God uh, eternally than um, as a father. So this is something that I thought about. I said, okay, people seem to have uh, – would it be easier for people to conceive of the traditional doctrine of, view, uh, doctrine of hell if they conceive of God as father than would it be if they conceived of God as mother, right? If they were to start conceiving of the maternal side of God, 
would that be harder for them then to come out with the doctrine of hell as we traditionally have it? And I think the answer is absolutely yes, right? I think that it's far easier to hold a view of God where God is masculine and hold the doctrine of hell because you often associate masculine with uh, you know being macho, being distant, right? Or when I was a kid, the big punishment wasn't for my mother. She would always tell me, uh, wait until your father gets home. Right? So punishment was associated with the male. And so if, like in mainline Presbyterian circles, you often associate God with uh, maternal characteristics, you call God mother, then the doctrine of hell becomes even more difficult, I think. Um, but enough with that liberalism. <laughs> what about uh, what about God as father, right? The scripture says. Well, I think what some people are going to do is they're simply going to say, you know, not everybody are God's children. And, and this is usually a view you hear in the, the great state of Texas. God is not a father towards all individuals, just as Texans. <laughs> no, um, God's not a father to everybody. And they'll, they'll trot out some passages that are taken out of context, like John 8. And they'll say, the Jesus refers to these people. He says, um, you're children of your father, the devil, right? And you wish to do um, that which your father desires. Okay, Jesus is not speaking to all people throughout all time in all history. He's speaking to the people right in front of him, right? Uh, he's speaking to a subset of a subset of a subset, right? He's speaking to those Jews who seek to kill him. He's not speaking about all Jews. He's a Jew. His apostles are Jews. They're not seeking to kill him other than Judas, right? Um, he's only speaking to those murderous Jews who seek to kill him. Now, the point that Jesus is making is that children imitate adults, right? They imitate um, especially their parents. And, and this is a well-known phenomenon. So you're a child of the one that you imitate. This is why when Peter tries to dissuade Jesus, right, according to the Synoptic Gospels, from going to the cross, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He even calls um, Peter Satan, right? And, and so, I mean, this is not really rocket science. You just tell somebody, well, um, a child is somebody who imitates you know, an, an adult, at least that's what Jesus is um, talking about. It's, it's, uh, he's talking about child in terms of imitation. So when you imitate the de uh, the devil, you're acting as a child of the devil. And when you imitate God, you're acting as a child of God. Now, Solzhenitsyn once said that the line between good and evil runs between every human heart, right? And I believe that the line between child of God and child of Satan can run between uh, many people's hearts, right? There are certainly Christians who at some point they act like a child of God. And at other points, they act like a child of the devil, Right. Um, so for the Christian perspective, for example, when you are gossiping about somebody, when you have like a, a anger towards somebody that turns into hatred of somebody, you're acting like a child of the devil, right? Like Jesus associated hatred and anger with murder. And Johnny says that the, the devil is a murderer, right? So if you're child by imitation, you're being a child of the devil right now. Well, you can still be in a salvific standpoint, right? Uh, so thus being a child of God. So that passage is crap. Um, so then you just have a bunch of passages too that refer to all individuals as children of God. So um, there's so many interesting ones that detail my book. One is from the Gospel of Luke. I think it's Luke chapter four, where it does a genealogy of Jesus that I bet you would want Emerson. It ties him all the way back to Adam. You know, now did such an individual exist? Eh. Well, it, it ties him all the way back. And um, it says that Adam, it says the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, it says Adam, the son of God. So you wonder, like, Adam, Adam, the son of God. If Adam is the son of God, well, then what does that make Adam's children? <laughs> right? um, or you'll have Jesus. He's in the Sermon on the Mount. He's addressing the people before him. He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your sons, how much more will your father in heaven? I'm like, wait, stop, full pause. So he's speaking to you who are evil. And he says, God is your what? Your father. Where you have Paul in Ephesians said, I bow my knees before the Father in heaven, after whom all the families of the earth are named. Or you have um, Paul in Acts 17, right? You talk, the passage, a famous passage about in him we live and move and have our being, right? You have um, passages that, that talk about all mankind being his offspring, right? We are all his offspring. So you have these passages all over the place that there is a sense in which we are children of God. Now, it always comes up, people say, but I thought believers were children of God. And so what I say is sonship is defined in different senses, right? So the Christians believe that Jesus is the unique son of God in a sense that they are not, right? Angels are referred to as sons of God in certain passages in the Old Testament. But I'm not an angel last time I checked. So an angel is a son of God in a sense that I'm not. Israel is referred to as a son of God or the people as sons of God, children of God. I'm not a Jew. Um, so there's a sense in which Israelites are sons of God in the sense that I am not. Are you getting you get the picture, right? That sonship is defined in different senses throughout scripture. Now, 
why do people push back so much against the notion that there's a sense in which all people are sons of God or children of God? Well, it's kind of obvious is because um, we know why parents, or a good parent, I should say, punishes their child, right? So when a parent punishes their child so that their child, if their child has wronged somebody else, so the child sees the worth, the intrinsic worth and value and the good of the one they have wronged against, the parent seeks to spur the child on towards the good of seeing that worth in others and to being reintegrated into the human community. All right, son, you learned your lesson. Now you can partake. Um, so, for example, let's say that um, I'm a parent towards Bob. Actually, Bob sounds like a 40-year-old. I'm a child towards Tim. And, um, you know, Tim got into a fist fight at school today. Oh, terrible, Tim. And uh, so what do I do? Well, I take a brick and I hit him on the side of the head and knock him out because doesn't he know that he's brought shame and such great shame to his family? He's offended the great honor of his father. Well, we would not say that Andrew's goodness has been manifested in the punishment of Tim, has it? <laughs> no. But if I punish Tim in such a way that I spurned him on for seeing the wrong which he did into being reintegrated into the community, people say, well, yes, Andrew's goodness has been preserved in the punishment of Tim, Right. So I think that it's be exactly because we all have an intuitive sense of why a good parent punishes somebody that certain individuals try to say that we're not all children of God. Yeah, like you were, um, you anticipated what I was going to ask next, which is, it seems like, at least in the Bible, there are many different ways in which the phrase child of God is used. And um, yeah, it seems like, well, in certain senses, we're all children of God. In other senses, some of us are and some of us aren't of the ability to become children of God in this other sense. But yeah, it's just, it's not used in one way consistently in every single mention of the term across the entire Bible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it still seems as if the fatherhood analogy that's intended to help us better understand our relationship to God. It's, I mean, do you think that the point about different senses of sonship, do you think that it undermines that at all? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think um, so. Uh, a good point to make here is you have annoying people like Frank Turek, right? Who that's just a good adjective to describe somebody like that. Um, is they'll try to gaslight you and say, um, "Well, why people go to hell is this? Have you ever tried to date somebody before, right?" Uh, and so he asked the women in the crowd, "Has has there ever been a guy who just persistently tried to go after you, and you just want him to go away?" Right. Well, that's kind of what it will be like for the damned and, and God is that he just respects them enough where he leaves them alone. OK, there's so many things wrong with that. Um, first thing I try to say is me and God, we're not equals. OK, there's a enormous ontological size gap, as Marilyn McCord Adams would put it, between me and God. It, it's far more like a parent and a child than two equal egalitarian adults. Right. So this is a horrible analogy. Um, and there are certain things that parents would see. So also the interesting thing is in this analogy, it's just so freaking weird. It's like, okay, so um, it's almost like Frank Turek has never dated himself because he would, doesn't know the art of wooing, right? Where how wooing works, Frank, is what often happens is people, they when they want to be with somebody, is perceived as pestering. They leave them alone, right, for a time. And then eventually that individual could say, oh, man, Mike was such a nice person and Derek's a bum. I really want Mike back, right? So it, 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 it's almost like in the story of Cinderella where if the prince had discovered that this is um, Cinderella, right? He discovers, like, oh my gosh, you know, you flip the, uh, fit the slipper. And he says, well, at any time that you want, don't feel rushed, but whenever you want, you can leave this house with the stepsisters and your stepmother and come and live with the house. It's a standing offer, standing offer, okay? Whenever you want. Um, right. So at what point is Cinderella going to leave that house okay i would hope if she's the same person as soon as possible right so what it almost is like what frank is um it's assuming is this is not a standing offer but of course he's begging the question because i believe it is a standing offer right and so sometimes for a standing offer what you need is for time to kick in and people realize what they're missing out on right and so i think that um god doesn't need to necessarily pester somebody like at every moment god's saying do you do you want that golden ticket here's that ticket come on in i think it could be that you have individuals like the damned who every once in a while, God gives them a transformative experience, right? So transformative experiences are like um, events that happen that can drastically change somebody's character or their perception on reality. So you have these in the Bible. You have these also in real life. Like you have individuals. I heard one story where there was a construction worker who he was a really outgoing guy, 
really personable, but he got hit by a, I think it was like a steel, it's like a steel beam or something at work. And just his personality was utterly changed. He was completely, like we say, completely different person, right? So this was a negative transformative experience, but we also have positive ones. Like um, we have individuals who they fall in love, we like to say, and they just, they just changed. Like my father, for example, was an introvert. Uh, prior to being married to my mom as years went by, and he changed through certain experiences he had. Or in the Bible, you have Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar looks at on Babylon he has made. It's like, oh man, look at Babylon that I have made. And God says, eat do, right? And so he, he's reduced to like an animal of the earth. But at the end of it all, he extols the God of heaven, realize, hey, there's only one sovereign. Um, so exactly why can't God do this with the damned, right? Why can't God bring about transformative experiences with the damned? Maybe as they're sleeping, he gives them something like a near-death experience where they they perceive the joy of um, the saints that they see former people that they loved are participating in this great joy. And they're like, man, I really want some of that, right? Exactly why can't he do this? It remains a mystery. <laughs> yeah, well, as the famous story goes, you know, the the one sheep wanders away and he goes, oh, 99 is enough. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of that, I mean, I was about to say, speaking of that song, but you know, there's that famous that famous song. I think it's called "Reckless Love" or "Relentless Love" or something. Mm-hmm. I um, my dad was making fun of me a little bit because the last time I visited, um, I was trying to remember that song. I'm like, what's that that new song? And I was like describing it, and he was like, maybe that was new the last time you were, <laughs> but it's not new anymore. <laughs> I mean, apparently, it's a very famous song, and um, a lot of people are like sick of it because like people really went went nuts with it for a little while, but. I think it's called Reckless Love. You know which song I'm talking about, right? Corey Asbury, I think, I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, at one point he talks about like leaving the 99 or whatever. And like the like hearing that song um in church when I was visiting my parents, I'm like, this is just like a straightforwardly universalist song. <laughs> it sounds like to me. Like I don't understand how these people are listening to it and not interpreting it that way because it seems kind of clear to me at least. Like it, it, that's how it sounded. I don't know if that was his intention at all, but anyway. Um, I don't know why that just sprang to mind, but um. no, yeah, uh, well, I remember um, once I became a universalist, listening to a lot of the songs that we sang, or especially if you go to a funeral, listening to the language that is used, and uh, it doesn't sound at all like the message that is preached. Right? There seems to be a disconnect. So, um, in that song that you're talking about, there's a line: "Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God." Right? Um, so, notice the language of never-ending. It's like really, it's never-ending. You'll see this in all sorts of Christian songs that are sung today in churches. That God's love never ends. Um, and so you have to wonder. It's like, okay, so it never ends. So you believe in postmortem repentance. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I don't. But you said you believe that God's love never ends, right? So I guess confusing. Like, or you go to a funeral. And like the cases that we've talked about, cases of suicide, it's really awkward. Uh, because you go there and, and there's this elephant in the room where people think, oh, you know, this person died in a state of sin. How do we comfort the parents? You know, what do we think about this? Because this is the idea where we all feel pity for the person, uh, right? At least if you're a morally sane person. Mm-hmm. And so the pastor usually will go up there and, and he'll read a passage about how God's love is so great and we have to trust her to the hands of God and there's no better hands to be held in. And it, it gets really odd because you're like, well, you're the same pastor who says that there is no such thing as post mortem repentance. But now it's almost like, but we hope that he was lying. <laughs> 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 yeah it's like i mean people talk about um universalism like it could really mess up kind of pastoral practices or like evangelism or something but there are so many situations where not being a universalist makes it very uncomfortable and awkward or you're trying to comfort people who like didn't have the exact right theology because everyone knows that's the criteria for getting into heaven like you need to have like something approximating the right theology and it's like and everyone knows they didn't have the right beliefs and it's like well that makes it kind of hard to uh to comfort people and it's like also just with evangelism you know like you mentioned those um those uh japanese converts or potential converts it's like well that's one instance at least where universalism <laughs> like the story told by universalists actually would have helped people convert and non-universalism was a huge obstacle to conversion um, but yeah, I just, I never understood really the, um, evangelism objection. Like people would suddenly stop caring about, you know, uh, seeking like 
truth, goodness, and beauty, or they would stop caring about, you know, the news would actually become like good news instead of like mostly bad news. And then people would stop caring about it or stop wanting to talk about it or something like it just doesn't make any sense to me. And it also seems to kind of imply that you or maybe most people are just engaged in like an Ayn Randian, like selfish, like just trying to get the most they can out of this relationship. And there's not really anything deeper than just this transaction. Like, I'm just going to get everything that I can and there's nothing else going on. Um, yeah, it just, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, especially if you're like currently a Christian and you're like, why would I be a Christian if I didn't have a threat hanging over my head? <laughs> like, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of um, the COVID pandemic in the sense that there were many Christian parents who, um, with their kids, they're like, we got to make sure to wear the mask. Um, you got to make sure to use hand sanitizer, constantly wash your hands, keep your you know social distancing, do all that. So it's like, okay, so you are like a helicopter parent and making sure they abide by all these rules so they don't get COVID and just simply die. Why aren't you like a helicopter parent when it comes to the potential of your child suffering, you know, eternal punishment? Like, it just seems like, why wouldn't you be like, nope, you, you can't go on TikTok. You can't go on these because these could lead you down a path of sin that leads you to die in a state of sin. Oh, you can't go on YouTube. Um, I got to, well, I got to put parameters on what you can see on YouTube. Because if you find those atheist channels and they make you really doubt, you could become an atheist and you die an atheist. You're going to go to hell for it just seems to be In fact, really I'm existent. just going to kill you right now because there's something might happen where you lose your salvation. Right now you're oh. saved. So uh, I'm just going to send you straight to heaven. <laughs> yeah, and, and there, um, there is one famous story of a mom with six kids who did just that. After hearing about the age of accountability, um, that after your child gets to that age, sorry, you know, it's out of your hands. She went home, she drowned all six of her kids. Um, wow. Now the question is, who was the most morally sane person in that room at that time? The pastor or the mother? Yeah. No, and, I mean, given, given the assumptions of like, think about how bad hell is going to be and think about how it goes on forever. I mean, she was thinking clearly given certain assumptions. I mean, it sounds horrible, but it's like, I mean, it does kind of seem like a, almost like a reductio of this kind of view. It's like, you know, I, I kind of roll my eyes sometimes when people are like, oh, well, nobody really believes this, that, or the other thing that Christians say. And it's like, no, they, they really do. But then again, like in their actions, they would write, they would perceive that, you know, what that mother did the same way that I perceive it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, given their beliefs, though, it seems like there's a little bit of a contradiction there. No, it, it can be extremely condescending from it's usually Christian apologists to when they approach these texts, like I said, they're like, oh, it's just metaphorical. And they'll instantly attack Dante for some like he's the whipping boy. Like, oh, we don't believe anything like Dante. Well, I'm sorry, because a lot of people that I have met take these texts literally, right? So you can't just like wave them away with the wave of the hand and say, oh, you, you know, it's just metaphor. You have to actually make a good case that it's metaphor. Because when I was a kid, it wasn't clear that it was metaphor, right? We heard people say, oh, it's metaphor. It just wasn't convincing. Um, I remember being in church where there was a evangelist. Oh God, you got to watch out for those. And um, the evangelist talked about a story about there was a downed helicopter and one of the soldiers inside was burning in flames, and he was screaming for his comrades to shoot him, to put him out of his misery. And eventually he died, but the evangelist made it quite clear that the same will not be true of you. That if you go to hell, that you will be in extreme agony, and you will wish that it could end, but it will not end. So this was really effective in getting some of my friends to go up, but I remember being furious. I remember just being absolutely furious at this. And um, I thought, man, if this was true, then I just would hate God. This sounds awful. It sounds worse than Stalin. But it just made so much nonsense to me that I just never really took it that God is like this. I just took it, this guy's a lunatic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt really bad for my friends. Like it's just psychologically horrible, the idea. Um, so yeah, so one thing is gaslighting. The other thing, um, so you were talking about evangelism. I, I hate this question. Um, so yeah, a few things to say on this point, right? So you get from some people, well, why bother being a Christian? And this is really revealing about that person. Like I said earlier, there's some people who they really want to live a non-Christian life. They really do, but they don't because they're afraid of punishment, right? So once you tell them, actually, the punishment isn't as bad as you think, then they start thinking, oh, how close to the line can I get? And like you and I said, universalists still believe that there's a hell, <laughs> So that individual could still go there, right? So it's like, okay. Um, 
the other thing is it's really weird because this is the same individual who constantly be telling people, oh, you know, uh, you should be a Christian simply because it's true. We're, relation, we're made for relationship with God. I mean, this is the best thing that a person can obtain to. So like, well, why isn't that sufficient enough? Like, why isn't that good mm-hmm. enough? Like, if I if you were married and your wife told you, you know, honey, if you ever cheated on me, you know, I would forgive you, uh, right? You, I wouldn't divorce you or anything. Uh, would that lead you to think, well, you know, I'm going on a trip to Germany. So that's really good news because, <laughs> no, no, uh, it's horrible, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, so I, I think it's, um, it's other nonsense. Why should we evangelize um, is a different question. So why be a Christian is one question. Why evangelize is different. Why evangelize say, um, okay, can you not think of any? So like usually I tell people, if you found out that there is no infinite punishment, right? There's no eternal punishment. Would you still tell people about Jesus? And every time they still say yes, right? So this, I'm like, what is the purpose of asking this question then? So in evangelizing, we are helping God. I shouldn't say really helping God. We are joining with God in the restoration of all things, right? That is what we're doing. We are bringing the gospel to people so that if you really believe that relationship with God is, is an intrinsically valuable thing, then you're helping people to obtain to that. You're helping people to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves, right? And uh, with the spread of the gospel, many Christians believe that um, there are also additional goods that come with it, right? So I give like 10 reasons why we should evangelize. So it's, it's not really an interesting question. In fact, it's really horrifying when you come across people who even ask that question. So, and then the last thing I'd add is that there's, is this like the Trump card? I got asked this on Capturing Christianity. It was really obnoxious. I actually really hated that interview. But I love Cameron, but I just hated the audience. Um, oh, dude, the, the Capturing Christianity live chat, like that proves hell exists. There's no need to debate <laughs> it at all. Like, no, I like, I like Cameron too, but the live chat during his streams is like, it's mind blowing. Like I, I think my commenters are bad. It's just a whole other level over there. Yeah. If capturing Christianity's live chat exists, then God does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, yeah, that, that brings up the whole thing of, um, I'll just say this real quick there. You're not going to meet any person here. Who's going to be able to list five apologists, right? People don't care about apologetics here. Like I said, uh, mainline Protestantism is different than Southern Baptists. Right. Um, so I remember when I was reading an apologetics book in the library one day, I actually got chastised. They said, you shouldn't be reading that stuff. You should be reading scholars. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I think one of the problems with apologetics, just from my perspective, is that it's really um, cis white male dominated, especially like capturing Christianity folk. It's just a bunch of cis white males arguing with each other. And um, I think that- we'll Hey, welcome say, to counter apologetics, baby. That's- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, I noticed the same thing. So- <laughs> Some people will instantly try to say, oh, you liberal, what's wrong with that? I say, well, well, no, it's like theology. No theology is done without an adjective. And I think that we bring a certain background with us that we might not even be conscious of to our conversations. And that's just evident when I look at something like Caption Christianity live chat, right? It's like, okay, this is really obnoxious. So anyway, hmm. um, all that to say, I was asked by some rather interesting individual if eternal conscious torment was true, like if you knew it was true, would you still uh, worship God, right? Would, would you still be a Christian? Uh, like I said, this is like the one hand clapping nonsense. Like it sounds really nice until you think about it for 10 seconds. So what's really rich is that William Lane Craig was once asked by somebody, well, um, if the God of Isis was real, would you worship him? And Craig's answer was simple. Well, on perfect being theism, the God of Isis cannot be God, right? As exactly. that being that which no greater can be conceived. It can't be by definition. So why can't I just say the same thing? Well, on perfect being theism, you're asking me about a square circle. That, that What you're describing can't possibly be God. So, um, so to those who would try to think they got a trump card and ask me that question, I would just reply the same way that Craig does. Yeah. It's, it's like, oh, if God was evil, would you worship him? It's like, no. <laughs> I mean, like, I given the like assumptions of perfect being theism, that's a nonsense question anyway. Like, the antecedent doesn't make any sense. But Still, like if you're saying, well, what if there was like some really, really powerful being that called itself God and it was evil? Would you worship it? It's like, no, <laughs> because I have like moral intuitions and a conscience and stuff. I can't just like pretend that good is evil or something like just because there's some really powerful being that says so. Um, and there actually is like a, you know, because moral intuition has come up quite a few times and it's like there's actually a decent moral argument for theism given by Dustin Crummett and Philip Swenson about our moral intuitions and their reliability so i think our moral intuitions are like more or less accurate 
Um, and they make this argument that says like, yeah, no, you, everyone has moral intuitions. Moral realism is true. Many things are good. And our moral intuitions do line up uh, with reality often. But it's kind of hard to explain that without God. Like, that's the argument. They're like, well, if God exists, it's actually pretty easy to explain how our moral faculties line up with moral reality. Like, you know, our moral faculties are actually tracking the truth. And we have kind of an easy explanation for that. Um, but if you take God out of the picture, it's harder to understand why our moral intuitions would align with moral truth. So they're granting like, yeah, as an atheist, you can be a moral realist. You can say morality is objective and independent of human opinion. We have moral intuitions that are kind of tracking the truth. And then they just kind of challenge us to actually explain that. Um, anyway, that's like a super in a nutshell version of that argument. But I think that's actually a decent argument for theism, like one of the few good moral arguments that exist. And then, you know, when you start talking about eternal conscious torment, a lot of Christians will be like, why are you trusting your moral intuitions? You can't trust those moral intuitions that God designed to track the truth. <laughs> I, I, saw, I seen it happen with Frank Turk. It's like, um, they'll try to be making an argument for objective morality. And they'll say, well, um, your moral intuitions all point to this. Like, we all agree on this, don't we? And then he's like, yeah, but my moral intuitions also tell me the eternal conscious torment is terrible. But you are falling into sin. Your faculties, you know, but it's like, okay. So I would I would add that um, something that you just said reminded me of uh, the concept of coercion. Okay. So this is really interesting. When you ask a traditionalist or a non-universalist, what is coercion? And, and then you say, because it's it just seems like God, on your view, is coercing people, right? Either believe or endure maximal punishment. I mean, I, I don't... I don't is there even a greater form of coercion than this? So yeah, this is an argument I make in my book is it just seems like coercion is what's right, going yeah. on. Yeah. Like it seems like it's as clear of an example of coercion as you could possibly get. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, well like freely believe and be saved. It's like, okay, what happens if I don't accept this free gift of salvation? <laughs> well, I hope you like it hot, you know, forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, there were, there were a couple more things I wanted to ask you about and then I'll let you go. We've been, talking for almost two hours here which i really appreciate your time by the way it's been a hell of a conversation <laughs> um so i you mentioned nebuchadnezzar and i kind of don't remember that story you're talking about where he was kind of like reduced almost like to an animal i think it's relevant to another conception of hell that my friend um john buck defends but could you remind me of that story sure yeah so it's in the book of daniel um in the early chapters where Nebuchadnezzar is said to look out upon Babylon, and so he credits himself with the greatness of Babylon. But then God, of course, um, thinks that the credit is due him, and so he makes Nebuchadnezzar eat the dew, right, of heaven is what the text will say. And so he, he becomes almost reduced to an animal-like state where he his hair grows long and unkempt. He's wild like the beast. He's out in the fields. But then it says that his reason returns to him, and it's at that point when his reason returns to him that he extols God and then says his, his kingdom is given back to him, right? So that's more or less the story in the book of Daniel. Well, my friend John thinks that that is sort of hell. Like he he thinks that um, the punishment that awaits people who don't convert or, you know, the, the people who are never going to see the beatific, beatific vision, like they're going to be sort of reduced to animals. Like they won't really be uh, rational agents anymore or moral agents and they'll keep existing but they'll be kind of reduced to that level and that's where they are forever. So, I mean, have you encountered this idea and, you know, what do you think about it? No. Yeah, of course I've encountered it. You have it from people like N.T. Wright, who I got to interact with one time. What an interesting individual. Um, he talks about this in Surprised by Hope, which actually isn't really hopeful. <laughs> and another book that I just recently read, uh, Spiritual and Religious, I think is what it's called. Um, and he makes this argument that, um, you become like what you worship, right? So if you worship God, you become like God. If you worship idols, you become like idols, like that which you worship until you become something exhuman is what he calls it. So in other words, hell becomes almost like an Auschwitz, uh, right? You become something exhuman. C.S. Lewis has the same view that he seems to set forward in two books. Um, one is the problem of pain and one is the great divorce. Uh, and which, you know, the, the grumble, the grumbler becomes a grumble, Right. So I have several things to say in this real, just real quick, but everybody, um, you can check out my book for my full thoughts. 
Um, so one thing is I would be interested in this individual's view on providence, right? If this individual is a Calvinist and has a view like that, that's extraordinary because God could most freely make this person come to him, right? Most freely, he could bring this person to himself. And if the chief end of man is to glorify God uh, and enjoy him forever, glorify God by enjoying him forever, then if God's in the business of seeking glory, why wouldn't he make this person most freely come to him and therefore glorify God by enjoying him, right? Or, or a Molinist, for example. I mean, William Lake Craig's objections are just utter ridiculous nonsense. Uh, where what he seems to be doing is presupposing that there is no such thing as post mortem repentance. Is that that's just what he's doing? And so, um, are we really to imagine that of the infinite number of feasible worlds on Molinism that God can actualize? There's so there's an infinite number of feasible worlds, and not a single one of them is a sufficiently populated universalist world, even uh, given most post mortem repentance. That's just really weird. And then also, I would ask someone like Craig, like, if you believe, if your view of the soul allows for something like reincarnation, and God knows that if he reincarnated this individual into a different world, that this individual will be saved, why wouldn't God do that? It's like, oh, no, to hell with you. Um, so, right. So, yeah, I'd be interested in this person's view of providence. But more to the point, I think this is a really, first of all, depersonalizing view, right? You, you see this um, this thing that's suffering right in hell. You're from the balcony of heaven. You see this individual languishing in hell. You ask, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, and instead of saying, that's Aunt Sally, right, your former aunt, it's like, oh, that's just a grumble. Um, so this is language you'll find usually among people who are proponents of genocide, right? Is is deeply depersonalized language. Like you'll see in Adolf Hitler who says that the Jews are a cancel on the bosom of Germany, right? This deeply depersonalizing language. Um, so that's one thing that I would hold against. It just seems like to great against moral intuition. It just seems God awful. But then the other thing is too, is if this individual is like no longer Aunt Sally, but formerly was Aunt Sally, uh, why does this individual still exist exactly? Why is this individual still being punished for the sins of Aunt Sally? You know, I, I guess some people could say, well, it's not being punished. Okay. So then why can't it be saved? Right. Like, uh, why does it have to have a miserable existence? Why can't it experience something like limbo, uh, perfect natural bliss? Right. And, and the idea is, well, it can, it, it can. Yep. He'll bring it to perfect natural bliss. Okay. So, so he can bring former Aunt Sally into perfect natural bliss, but he couldn't somehow preserve Aunt Sally as Aunt Sally and bring Aunt Sally into supremely worthwhile happiness. And, and why is that exactly? So, one thing I guess people say is, well, soul building. I said, and then I would point to examples where it does seem like people have had memory loss in this world. Right, uh, you'll have stories. People who have memory loss. Let's say that they have memory loss and they became a Christian and they got saved. And you start to scratch your head and you say, "Well, so God actualized a world. Let's use Molinism. God actualized a world in which this individual received brain damage sufficient enough that this person, uh, when introduced to the gospel, became a Christian. So why can't God do that exactly with the people in hell? <laughs> um, you know, like." Um, so I guess we'll come down to, well, that just sounds like consequentialism to me, right? But if you're a consequentialist, so what, right? So then we have to debate that. So those are a few things um, off the bat uh, real quick. Is one, it sounds deeply uh, depersonalizing. Two, if, is this individual still being punished for the sins of the former person it was um, or not would be a question that I'd have. And uh, yeah, so those are just some off the top of my head. All the objections to universalism are, are just garbage. Like I think most of them are are bad. Like the best ones are like kind of thought provoking and like oh yeah maybe that's a puzzle that needs to be solved. But none of them are like these knockdown arguments that they're often presented as. And there's nothing that justifies the like low standing of universalism in the you know contemporary church at least in, in this country. Like the way, it is not taken seriously at all. Like it is not treated as a serious option like by the Christians I grew up with it's not it's not discussed like its existence is not acknowledged even and i'm saying there that cannot be justified like even if you're not a universalist you have to say like okay a, a, a rational person who is a christian who is operating in good faith could probably be a universalist <laughs> like mm -hmm. you have to at least admit that um anyway but there's one argument against universalism that i think is kind of more thought provoking than the others because it um it only seems to be relying on certain assumptions 
that are very widely held about God's willingness to communicate his message. You know, like we're talking about revealed religion, and it would be weird to say that God revealed it very poorly. So it seems like on certain views where God is able and willing to communicate with us and, you know, share the good news and like issue this revelation, then the popularity of certain doctrines does seem to sort of become a referendum on like the truth of those doctrines. Because, I mean, in short, it's like, it seems pretty weird that if universalism is true, it's believed by so few Christians, you know, especially since God is able and willing to communicate his message and, you know, the right theology or whatever, you know, I mean, God is sending messages, inspiring texts, you know, he's communicating with us in all these different ways. So it does seem pretty weird that the correct view would be like a minority position. No, yeah. Um, let me answer that. And then I just checked my book. So I just remembered. Let me give, um, if I we have time, a couple more objections to annihilationism, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Um, because that's a heap of garbage. Um, so, yeah, what do we do with this? Well, this is an argument that you it comes up repeatedly in literature, usually from traditionalists, right? Because they are the traditional view. Um, so this usually comes to Matthew 25, 46, where it, there's an argument. I can't remember who made it, but he said, if, um, how should we interpret Ionia? Should we turn it as eternal, a long time, pertaining age? He said, well, we should think that Jesus wasn't incompetent and that Jesus had in mind um, if the, he knew how people would perceive the word, its usage, right? And knowing that uh, the majority of Christian tradition would perceive um, this word to mean eternal, he decided to go ahead with this word instead of a different word. Right. Well, the problem is that there were many church fathers who interpreted that word right to mean just a long time, like Origen and Gregory of Nyssa and others. And in fact, there were, uh, Augustine refers to a, very many people who were universalists during his day. And Basil says the same. I mean, uh, Laurie Romelli has a massive tome talking about uh, people, individuals um, who were universalists in the early church. So I can just make the same argument firstly and say, well, Jesus wasn't incompetent, and Jesus knew that very many individuals would come to see that that word meant just uh, a very long time. Thus, that's why he used the word. So I can use the exact same argument. But I, I think what they mean is, uh, well, but Andrew, we have a strong tradition, about uh, 1,400 years strong, of eternal punishment being the predominant view. Well, the thing is, I'm not sure how long um, the church will be around the world. So that sounds really intimidating, Right. Until you start thinking, well, but what if the church lasts for about 20,000 years, okay? And uh, yeah, the traditional view dominates for 1,600, but oh, by golly, the universalists, they dominate for 17,000 uh, plus years, right? Um, so then it doesn't seem as impressive. So I think this argument is only going to be impressive in hindsight, finally, right? So yeah, if, if Jesus was to come back tomorrow, and he didn't tell us yet, right, which view is right? I say, well, you know, that is problematic. I mean, it was the majority of you throughout the entirety of church history. But if church history is actually going to be a lot longer as I'm of the opinion that we're in it for the long haul. That is going to be a long, long time. For me, it, it, it's not really much of an argument to make. I say, well, if Jesus is not incompetent and he knew that uh, very many in the early church would perceive this to be just meaning a long time, then that's why he used it, right? And also, if the church lasts for a very long time, I definitely see trends towards universalism. I can totally see how universalism will be the dominant view for a very long time. So if you and I were to have this discussion, let's say 1,800 years from now, uh, I'm just, no, 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 I'm um, sorry, um, 18,000 years from now, if you can imagine, and universalism has dominated for 16,000 plus years, uh, I think that our views of this question would change, right? So yeah, I, I mean, that that is kind of granting the logic of the argument, though. Um, I mean, because... If that was the case, then you'd be you'd be right. And like universalists could make the exact argument I just made, but in defense of universalism. Um, but the whole point about like, well, Jesus isn't incompetent, right? Like, and I mean, we have to interpret the evidence that we actually have. Like, so we're having this conversation right now, you know, after 1400 years of this being the traditional view. So like in the epistemic situation that I'm in, then it does seem like it is evidence against universalism, unless you want to say, well, maybe God just doesn't care if people have the right beliefs about this. But it seems like, given pretty standard assumptions, he he would. No, I would agree that, um, yeah, I would think that it is some evidence against universalism. I'm not opposed to that. I just think at the end of the day that the majority lies with universalism. But I do say that 
Um, it should be problematic to universalists that this view has been the dominant view for a long time. That that for me was a really big holdup. So yeah, I would agree. But but you think um, that I mean, do you actually think that universalism is you know kind of ramping up? Like, do you is that kind of a serious prediction on your part that universalism will kind of be dominant in the future? So um, yeah, let me say a few things on this. Uh, one is um, a couple of decades ago. Zondervan published a book that was called Four Views on Hell. And it they had a literal, a metaphorical, an annihilationist, and um, I think it was a purgatory view, right? Well, not that long ago, Zondervan uh, published a new edition of a Four Views on Hell, right? With comp new essays. And in it, you had Jerry Walls presenting a purgatory view. You had some forgettable person presenting the traditionalist view. You had John Stackhouse presenting the annihilationist view, and then Robin Perry presenting the universalist view. This is really interesting. In just a span of a, a few years, Zondervan, a, a very conservative evangelical publishing house, incorporates a universalist essay in a four views book on hell. And actually, I think it's Preston Sprinkle. He was an essay, um, he was writing either the introduction or the conclusion to the book, and he said that Robin Perry, the universalist, made very impressive arguments for universalism. So that was really unprecedented. But then you also had Rob Bell, who I think Rob Bell did a lot in um, just bringing attention to this issue, right? I remember his book exploded on the scene. Um, another person who's more big in mainline Protestantism for making universal impossibility, his name's Karl Barth. I don't know how familiar your listeners are with Karl Barth, but he's like a rock star uh, in Presbyterian circles. And so in, in his work, it did seem like it just – inevitably led towards universalism and that opened a whole can of words then you had hans urs von balthazar in catholic circles who um he had a book um, um dare we hope that all be uh, shall be saved right and uh, you also had metropolitan Callisto square in orthodox circles then you had you had sergius bulgakov um you had a lot of eastern orthodox fellows da of course david bentley hart uh, david bentley hart was like um he reminds me of if you've ever watched the lord of the rings and uh, there's the battle at Helm's Deep, and all of a sudden you see Gandalf on the hill. The White Rider has come. Right, that's what <laughs> that's what he kind of is for Universalists. So I think over time, it's just become a, a more and more public voice amongst prominent theologians. So um, Alvin Plantinga, for example, he's not a theologian, but he's someone who, according to two of his students, right? I talked to Jerry Walls and Josh Grasmussen did an interview, seemed to be some sort of Universalist. So yeah. you have one of the most famous Christian philosophers, a Universalist. You have the most famous Protestant theologian last century, Karl Barth, was a universalist, or seems like he was a universalist. Um, you have Hans Urs von Balthasar leading there, Callisto Ware. I mean, the list goes on and on. This would not be seen <laughs> not that long ago. And then what's interesting is Lee Strobel had a book uh, called The Case for Heaven, something like that. And in it, he had to dedicate a chapter, a portion of a chapter, to talking about universalism. I mean, that wouldn't have even been something that you would need to address in these books like 100 years ago because it was just obviously wrong, don't you see? Mm -hmm. But now he's talking about Rob Bell and David Bentley Hart. So now I think this is becoming a more public conversation. Um, so I do see this becoming the dominant view amongst those who hold to an afterlife view in mainline Presbyterian circles. Uh, I'm sorry, mainline Protestant circles. There, there just is a general trend among more mainline Protestant circles to – leaving the afterlife behind. Um, I've met quite a few people here. They don't believe in afterlife, nor they believe in demons, right? It, it's very different than if you're in conservative circles. Um, but those who do in mainline Protestantism hold to some view of the afterlife, I think that, yes, they will move pretty rapidly towards universalism, but they don't have the numbers. The numbers really lie in the conservative Christians. So the question usually comes from people, do you think that they will move in massive numbers to universalism? And I say, I think they're going to move in massive numbers towards annihilationism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they think they're doing themselves a service. Like, oh, we're, uh, it's such a much more merciful option. Like, oh, we, we really achieved something. High five. Uh, but I think that as time goes on, eventually you'll see that many more Christians will be universalist than in years past. Well, I mean, we arguably do see like large scale moral progress in other areas. Um, you know, there's a case to be made there. So, I mean, it, it seems like this shouldn't be immune you know, I mean, annihilationism is better than, you know, that super strong <laughs> eternal conscious torment view. I mean, I think it's still wrong, but it's like, yeah, I mean, just having people die is better than um, having them tortured forever. And uh, it, it it's annoying to me when atheists do this, but a lot of atheists say that they wouldn't want to live forever anyway, which is complete cope. Obviously, nobody wants to die. Um, 
I mean, I grant that there are certain goods that come from death that wouldn't exist if death didn't exist. So like there are certain good things that, ha that, that do come into existence just because death exists. Like I grant that still don't want to die though. <laughs> I would love to have eternal life. Um, anyway, but yeah, I, I mean, annihilationism is an improvement and it's funny because, you know, we're talking about it like, Oh wow. What a, what a fantastic leap ahead for all these like, you know, like conservative evangelicals, but like that is like the wild liberal option for a lot of people. <laughs> like they're totally yeah. like fringe that like that far and no further like annihilationism, you know? So it still would be moral progress, I guess. No. Yeah. And so, um, like I said, I, I want to bring this back just quickly to annihilation and some additional comments for uh, listeners yeah, to yeah. think about. So, mm -hmm. so one is a, an argument from love that I've made against annihilationism, borrowing from Ryan T. Mullins and Jordan Westling, in which Jordan Westling sees love like what is love? You know, as the famous song said, um, and he sees love as caught, taught, tied up in a triage of factors. So, one is you value the existence of something. Then you value the flourishing of that something and you desire union with that something, right? So you value the existence, the flourishing and union with that something. Okay. So um, how does universal affair? Does God value the existence of that something? Sure does. The flourishing? Sure does. Union? Absolutely. <laughs> what about annihilationism? How does God value the existence of something by annihilating it? How does he value the flourishing of something by annihilating it? How does he value union with something by annihilating it? I mean, this puts a whole new connotation on friend zoning somebody. Um, so, so that's just an argument from love that I don't think that annihilationism satisfies conditions of love while universalism does. That would be one argument. Okay. Um, is there any other argument that you want to, uh, touch on? Sure. Real, real quick. Yeah, I yeah. promise quick. Okay. Um, so one would be from the atonement. Um, mm -hmm. so if you held to something like penal substitutionary atonement theory, right, then this would be really odd for the annihilationists, um, as many people have pointed out. So if, if Christ died a death that we deserved, and the death that we deserve is ultimate annihilation, then wouldn't Christ be annihilated? <laughs> uh, so how, how does this work exactly, right? So that reduces the Trinity to a It makes Chris, uh, Easter a second Christmas, right? It just seems absolutely heretical because mm -hmm. people, well, you know, uh, but the, the nature died. Yeah, but that goes against Chalcedon. And also, it's not natures that deserve to die. It's persons that deserve to die. Right? So that it wouldn't seem like Christ is an actual substitute. Um, so that would be one argument. It's from the atonement. It would say that on the, the dominant uh, views of the atonement that these individuals hold, it should lead them actually away from annihilationism and towards universalism. The other one would be the question of double jeopardy. Um, is Why bother raising the damned? Because this could lead into double jeopardy with the idea that you you are punished twice for the same sin. Um, so, right. So what they'll try to do, so if, if the sin is, if they're defining death is to be disembodied and breathing, which is what I hear constantly from annihilationists to be alive is to be embodied and breathing, to be disembodied, uh, to be dead is to be disembodied and not breathing. Okay. Well, um, if you believe in a resurrection, right, then these individuals, they already died. They're disembodied and not breathing and God's going to raise them again. Why bother, right? Uh, why bother? And, and so usually what they'll say is, well, but it's not just death they deserve. It's the manner of death. So, right, um, I think it was Tojo of Japan. Uh, he tried to get away from the allies by committing suicide, right? I think he had a pill or something, tried to swallow it. But they, um, they didn't just let him die. They revived him because he had to stand trial for his crimes and so they could hang him. So he didn't just deserve to die. He deserved to be hung. So this is what they'll say. And I'll say, well, this, this is just really weird. So if the idea is, well, what matters is the manner of death that they achieve. God could still obtain this in their lifetimes without them having to be raised again. Um, so if, if you hold to some of you of meticulous divine providence, like Calvinism or uh, Molinism, God could do this in this lifetime. All right. Uh, and also, if you hold to the idea that um, God cannot enact cruel and unusual punishment, as many people think he can't through moral intuitions, that God can make sure that every person meets their fitting end in this lifetime and thus does not need to be resurrected, period. Um, the other thing is they say, well, this, but this, these people, they need to stand trial for their crimes. They, they need to know why they're suffering for this. I said, okay, um, well, God could do that kind of like with Dumbledore and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, right, at, at the, the, the station, uh, right? Um, he could, at the moment of death, judge the person, say, Emerson Green, you are going to die. He doesn't need to raise them. He can just do it right then and there. And this is where it comes down to. I, I've heard from one guy, I can't remember his name. He said, oh, but don't you see, 
the saints need to feel vindicated. <laughs> the saints need to feel vindicated. And so God raises them so the saints can witness God's justice upon them, uh, the damned, and thus feel vindicated. I'm sorry. Um, on so many levels, this is just really abhorrent. So you need to tell me, let me think of um, like my sister, okay? Uh, I have six other siblings. Let's just pick one. Let's say my sister, Emma, who's a wonderful individual, that, you know, later on in life, she starts having questions about the Christian faith, questions that her other friends aren't asking who are Christians. And she just really can't get someone to give a good answer. And she, she really wants to hold on to her faith, but she just can't, right? And she, she winds up, she just can't believe that Christian stuff anymore. And, um, you know, she helps out with ha uh, Habitat for Humanity, just a, a really good person, right? She does all this charity work, but then um, on a mission trip, she's abducted, right? She's brutally raped forced into the sex trade, and eventually murdered. But don't you know that when she's raised again on the great day of judgment, I'm going to stand to my feet. Huzzah, huzzah, I feel vindicated. Right? This seems to incredibly, what it does is it tries to sharply differentiate me from the persons that I love, right? As if I feel vindicated in this just punishment. The other thing is I don't have to be present at an individual's trial to feel vindicated. So when Hitler, for example, when he, he died in World War II, there were many people around the world who felt vindicated who they weren't present in his bunker. So they just need to be rela relayed the information. Hey, this person, he got his comeuppance. So the saints don't actually have to be present to witness this trial, right? So there is no good reason I can think of why God needs to resurrect the damned other than this, that God is an open theist and God doesn't know whether giving these individuals another chance will mean that they will eventually repent. So why does God raise the damned? because he wants to give them another chance. That's the only way I can make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I was kind of operating under the assumption that annihilationists thought that we die and then it's just over. And yeah. that's the, I, didn't, I guess I wasn't really picking up on the, oh, no, 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 you're going to die once and then they're going to be raised and then they're going to kill you again. Yeah. Like, okay. I mean, I mean, I was kind of hoping annihilationism wasn't true for that reason but now that i know i'm going to be resurrected at least i'll know that i was wrong you know there, there's a chance for me to find out um which i assume is part of the reason why that even exists in the doctrine <laughs> so that way all the people who die they don't just die and then they never find out they were wrong you know they're resurrected they're told they were wrong then they you know it, again it's the hell is for other people to go to it's like if you think that really is part of the motivation then it becomes maybe clearer why the dead have to be resurrected only to be killed again. <laughs> um, but yeah, annihilationism, what a cool view. Anyway, um, so are there any uh, further resources for universalism that you want to recommend for people who are interested besides obviously once loved, always loved? Sure. Yeah. So if they're interested in a good podcast, um, I'd say go check out Grace Saves All by David Artman. I've mm -hmm. been on a couple of times. David Bentley Hart has been on it. All the prominent universalists going, all the cool kids, right? So go make sure to check that channel out. Uh, I'll be having a debate on Premier Unbelievable, if your listeners are ever familiar with that channel. That yeah. will be in January. Um, Sean McDowell is supposed to be hosting, so that'll be fun. Um, so be looking for that. I've done other interviews that you can find on YouTube. I mentioned my Capturing Christianity one. I've done presentations on Adherent Apologetics. I did one debate on Adherent Apologetics. So if you can find my interviews there. If you're looking for book resources, um, I'd say that David Artman has a really good, short, cheap book, right, that I, I really like. It's called uh, Grace Saves All. Definitely worth the purchase. But then if you're looking for more, you know, philosophical reads or more exegetical, I'd say if you want exegesis, go check out The Evangelical Universalist by Robin Parry. If you're looking for more philosophical work, go check out Thomas Talbot's The Inescapable Love of God. And if you're just looking for a darn fun read, Read That All Shall Be Saved by David Bentley Hart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I very much enjoyed that one. <laughs> um, and there's also this, um, I think it's, I don't know if it's a book or a paper, but it's called Universalism in the Bible by Keith DeRose. Mm -hmm. And you can get it on the internet for free. It's, um, it's posted on Yale's website or something. But um, we love David Bentley Hart on this podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming on. I had a really good time talking to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was uh, very enjoyable. We got a few laughs in, and that's always what counts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, check out the book, um, Once Loved, Always Loved.